Marla. Marla, would you unmute, please? Yep, I'm working on it. <laughs> okay, let me see here. How do I get my... Hmm. Can you see me? No. 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 <laughs> Hi, there I am. Yeah. Hi, <laughs> Thank you. Great. Um, well, welcome. Um, thank you for applying for three grants for Hands On Art. Um, tell us about uh, each project, please. And I, I did hear your discussion before, and I, I did three of them just for the simple reason of a little bit of clarification and because it was a large amount. So um, instead of just doing one for 6,000, I decided to break it up for each project so you could have more specific questions if you had any. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, no problem. So um, the first project is a Gammographs. It is uh, based on the work of Yakov Agam. He is a kinetic and optical art artist. Uh, he's actually still alive. I think he's 94, 95 right now. And um, he does work with uh, movement in his art. Uh, very, very different for kids. Um, I have a, this is the example that my, my son did. We did this many years ago. Um, so it'll probably be the third time we do this project, but you can see how it goes. I don't know if you can see it here. When you look at it straight on, it's um, it looks like a modern piece of art, but as you turn it and kids walk down the hall, it goes from cool. warm, cool colors. Awesome. So, so it's very, um, it's teaching them geometric and organic shapes. It's teaching them warm and cool colors. It's um, hand eye coordination through folding paper and then uh, movement and art and how how movement can be a part of that piece of art. Um, I, are you all, you're all familiar with Hands on Art? Uh, the program? Yes, and I'm also familiar with this artist, so it's nice to see. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, <laughs> we're really trying to find a real, um, we're, we're always trying to build diversity into our program, either with the um, contemporary or historical artists or with our guest artist who's teaching it. So this year I was able to find um, Robert Sanchez out of Tacoma, who is our guest artist. I just filmed him this last weekend doing it. And um, it's, it's exciting. You know, it's we were challenged with having to come up with projects that uh, because our financial structure is such that we are based upon shared items in the classroom. And so this year it was a huge challenge to find projects that we could do where we could afford to buy the materials and give them to the students. So for this one, they are getting 60, a box of 16 color crayons, um, warm and cool colors for each, and they get to keep those crayons. So. Um, we feel really proud of that, too, that probably during this time, uh, you know, a good portion of our students will be getting brand new crayons at this time of year, which is really good, which we really love. So that's good. We've also been able to morph into a program that has been, you know, typically when we have parent volunteers and we're doing it in the classroom with the teachers, uh, we've been able to package each project individually and get it home to kids for um, remote learning as well. So. Um, as the schools are coming back and they're doing hybrids of in-home, at-home, this is going to, it's super flexible for the teachers as well. So they can do the project in their classroom or send it home for in-home learning with their parents. So. That's wonderful. Um, any questions from anyone? No, I mean, are, are you going to go through each of the grants for us, um, Marla? because they're all similar structure, right? Each of the, there's three of them, but they're all about in the classroom or are they different? They're all, so our program has four projects a year and um, this is for three of the projects. It's challenging, Molly knows, but I get, I get all nutted up because of, we, our fiscal year is the school year, not necessarily a January to December. So um that's why they're one of them's this year one of them's two of the projects are for next year and our next school year um but we do four projects a year that is the comprehensive uh art program that the district has that is that hits all students so um, we are in every classroom we serve all over 4,000 students in peninsula school district uh the numbers look similar or we give a budget for the for the projects and I make it work within that budget. So I'm out looking for materials and getting deals because I'm buying in such bulk um, and that sort of thing. So 
for this project, it's um, crayons, cardstock, cardstock to mount it on, um, a pencil to do the initial work with, and all of those things have to be packaged individually and they're sent home, sent to the schools and then sent home with the kids if they're doing it at home and they get to keep those products, so. Okay. Um, Marla, what, what's the, um, the fee for printing? What do you do for, what, what kind of printing is that? Printing is, uh, we print the labels for the back of the project that say teacher grade class. And for this year, we're printing an instruction sheet that goes on the front. That's an instruction sheet for all of the parents or teachers. And then there's also a instruction sheet that's printed on the front of the bag. Because we, what we have to do is we have to get all the product get it out to volunteers to have them pack the packs, get them back in, then they go into classroom packs and they go to the teachers so that the teachers decide when they wanna be, when they wanna implement in the classroom. So there's three different printing um, portions for this year um, that's kind of unique. I can show you, oh, I don't have one right here. $300 just, well, I guess three, how many, so how, how many total uh, packets are you putting together then for this? 4,400. Okay, sorry, yeah. Wow. Okay, so you're printing uh, probably 8,800 instruction sheets if there's two right. per. They're only, they're only um, I should have one here, I'm sorry. Here's an example of the label. There's the label yeah. that's on the back of the project. And then the other thing, it's like a half sheet. It's, it's like this big. Oh, gotcha. I get, I work with Minuteman Press and they give me a very good nonprofit discount. So they're okay. great. Great, thanks. How many volunteers does it take to create 4,000 packets? Wow. <laughs> well, I just did my list right here. There's one, two. There they all are right there. There's about 30 right now that are, wow. I'm doing them. I'm just packing them right now into packs of 100. Mm -hmm. And then uh, next Saturday, I will have a whole group come pick them up. And then Monday, I'm doing delivery to those people who can't get out. And then I go, they get two weeks to do them. And then I go, I pick them all back up. And then we sort them for teachers. So it's been quite challenging this year. It's really not the way the program was intended to happen. But, you know, it's happening. This, this isn't the way life was intended to happen. No, I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think so at all. But I'm really proud of us that we figured out how to do it. You know, um, it's been it's been a wild ride, but the community has been amazing. And um, you know, really because all of my volunteers are at home with their kids, so they don't really they're not don't have a lot of time to help. Whereas typically they would be um, facilitating in the classroom, that sort of thing. And so I've really leaned into my community volunteers, and they've just been absolutely fantastic, absolutely yeah. fantastic. Cool. The fourth Marla, oh, oh, I just had a question for you. It's Jennifer. Um, if I guess with the students going back to school, regardless of whether they're on campus or not, this program will still be remote for this year. Well, it will be. It could be in the classroom. It's just oh. that all the materials need to be individually packaged because of COVID protocol. They can't have anything shared. Did I lose you guys? I I don't see anybody. Are you there? We're I, here. I you. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, we're here. I see yeah. you. Oh, oh, there's somebody. Hi. Um, yeah, so that I, we're just making sure that it's all individually uh, packaged so that there's not, no shared materials with the kids. And so t I, we really wanted to give the teachers flexibility. If they want to give them an assignment to do at home, they can do it. The kids can do it at home. If they want time in the classroom to do it, you know. The main thing is that the kids really need this creative output right now. They need they need this ability to to express themselves and 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 have art. And it's just more important than than ever. I feel so. I totally agree. <laughs> Thank you. Uh huh. And um, Marla, the video productions that you do, the videos, is that something you normally don't do during normal times when you can have instruction, or is there usually the uh, the video instructions? Yeah, no, you guys should take, if you, if you haven't had a chance, go ahead to our website and take a look at them. Um, there's two of them up this year already. Cool. And uh, we, oh, but that's something that we do all the time because typically when our volunteers go into the classroom to help facilitate the project, they are showing that video as well because the art, 
the docents are just facilitating it, the parents are facilitating it, but the, the, our guest artist is actually teaching it. And that's one of the things that we're super excited about because trying to get an artist to come into 190 classrooms just doesn't, you, you can't do it. You can't make it work, but but by video and by um, doing a film and my videographer has just taken our program to the next level because she does the historical intro video that we've got now is just amazing. So um, she, we, I write that script and then we edit that together and uh, it's, it's great. One of the things that we've done in the last two years is um, transition to even more directed learning for K through two and three through five. So we do actually two films. So we do a K through two version and a three through five version. And, you know, that came from one of our docents who was like, you know, it's a little bit too much for kindergartners and a little bit juvenile for the fifth grade. I'm like, you're right, it is. So let's make it better. So and we try and, you know, we're always a work in progress. I say, you know, <laughs> we're, we're not perfect. Yes, wonderful. Are, are there any more questions on um, this particular hands-on art project? No, no. I mean, I've, I've read through them all. I think they're all great, but I want to hear about the Watts Tower too. And the I, other... love, the, I yeah. love the Watts Towers. Can I go on to that one? It's my favorite. It's the, it's the first project that I ever got really interested in for doing this way back 17 years ago. It was like our, one of our first ones. And um, it, it, do you guys know the Watts Towers at all in yeah. LA? I don't yeah. know. Yeah. So um, I don't think everybody is. So you might want to ex explain. So the, so the Watchtowers are in LA. They are a historical um, state historical landmark. And Simon Rodia was an old tile, uh, tile mason in LA. And he had this land and he started making these vernacular architecture. You can Google Watchtowers and take a look at them. They're amazing. And I think the city of LA at one point was trying to knock them down and they tried to knock them down and they, they wouldn't, couldn't even knock them down because they were so structurally sound. And um, historical society came in and saved him, but he was this eccentric guy. He saved all these different pieces and found tile pieces. And he listened to Enrique Caruso um, opera music when he was building them. And so um, we teach the kids that, you know, they learn about um, the Watts Towers in LA, they learn about Simon Rodia who built them. Uh, there's a really great book, The Wonderful Towers of Watts that Lamar, uh, Lamar Burton, you know, read. We grab pictures from that and then they actually make their own little Watts Towers. So here was a couple that I had left over. I don't know if you can see them. They've got a clay base because all of his stuff was cement and clay and he did like a mosaic piece along the bottom. And then the kids build their own little Watts Towers. So. It's one of my favorite ones. That's great. Um, any any questions from anyone about this project? Love that. No, um, one of, I would. I, I would know under. I wonder under different times if you'd ever have a display of all of these projects. You know, we did. We've done an installment at the Harbor History Museum before. Um, it's quite time intensive and quite challenging, and so. Mm -hmm. Most of our efforts go into just making the program run. Um, you know, you have to collect the artwork from the kids, get it there hung. I mean, it was it was really fun. It was it was a good for them. One of the ones we're going to do next year is um, what was my other one with you? Uh, in February next year, we're going to do. It's a quilt project, but of course it can't be quilt and sewing. But it's going to be representative of a quilt project and the Underground Railroad. And yeah. so one of our, what this uh, local artist, Gail Beard, she has done pictures of these quilts. She's painted pictures of these quilts that had um, maps and things woven into them for the Underground Railroad, it's super interesting. So for Black History Month, that's what we're gonna do. And we're gonna have them on display, hopefully someplace around town that will draw kids in there. And you know, we are always trying to think of some way to get them to display their, th their art, but... Um, Normally it goes up at the ESC office at the, you know, a classroom or two gets put up there. But if you have any ideas or want them anywhere, let me know. Oh, I mean, well, let me think about it. But I just, <laughs> I love the idea of the quilts. I think um, we gave a grant to that project mm -hmm. and her lecture. Yeah. yeah. And and was, oh, oh did you, yeah, you did the book. You did the book. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's great. I love it. So 
trying to capitalize on that, you know, have her artistry and then have her display of her painting somewhere and have the kids go down to see, you know, get, get feet in the door. I really want to try to do it for Oceans, Oceans 5 because they're just struggling so much, you know. Um, anyway, that's in my mind. <laughs> great, that's great. And well, what, I'm, what, I was going to say- Oh, go ahead, sorry. I'm sorry, I was going to say that um, I think that it was the fishing boat paintings that we, I worked at the History Museum and um, those fishing boat paintings, I think that was hands-on art. Yeah, that's, that's and actually- it, they, were, they were very popular. People loved seeing them. It was really great. I don't know if I can see that. That um, is actually the project that we're doing right now is the um, uh, Harbor Heritage Pen and Ink fishing boat. I want to show you this picture here. Can, can you guys, I don't see if you can see this. Can you see him? Uh, no. 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 Lower, Let me, lower maybe. Whereas it's on my screen, I can't tell. Oh, oh here it is. Hello. Here he is. Oh. 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 Doesn't he look good? He did a great job. Oh, <laughs> second grade. oh that's great. He's second grade. I know that's what we're doing right now. Here's another one. She added color to hers on her own, but can you see it? Oh, there it is. Oh, nice. Oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> oh, yeah. Sweet. Um, yeah, but that lesson is actually on our website right now if you want to take a look. Sweet. Yeah. Well, and also thank you for talking about the Watts Towers. I've never heard of them, but they looked really amazing. I'm yeah, it, it's, it's crazy. I mean, it's so... Um, it's, it's, and I love talking about Watts and, and that area of Los Angeles. And so it's good. Hey, next year, could you do one for adults? I, <laughs> really, I would really love to take your classes. Oh, <laughs> <that's great. laughs> what you can do is you can adopt a classroom and then you can come to Docent trainings. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, I might do that. Marla, do you all have an artist identified yet for the Watts Tower project? No, I don't want to do it. Um, <laughs> oh, 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 I'm good. I'm good. Um, but, um, you know, you mentioned earlier, really thinking about diversity. I wonder, like, what kind of artists are you looking for for uh, that filming that lesson? I have, um, I have a suggestion well, for you. If, oh, let you, let you, you know, I mean, for, for projects that we've already designed and done, I just need an artist that might be in, you know, sculpting or media or clay, but it doesn't have to be. I mean, just an artist, you know, who maybe works in mixed media, that sort of thing. Um, Marty Reese did it last time and she was fabulous. Meredith, uh, what's her last name? Meredith, Meredith. Anyway, she was our other, other artist. Does the artist need to be from Gig Harbor or? Uh, no. Okay. I have a friend who actually, she's a docent at the um, Seattle Art Museum, but a former designer and, and artist. And um, she uh, also just recently did a, pro a sculpture, a clay sculpture project. Um, oh, okay. So I'll, I'll reach out to you separately. I'll, I'll let me check with her first to see if something she'd be interested in. Sure. Um, doing the, um, the she's about, African uh, as well so the commitment is a two and a half hour filming and then um the, the trainings if we have we're having the training nights um and working with me for a couple hours in, in between and then we do have a stipend for them of 350 dollars so so um so what about whimsical creatures what about that one yeah. whimsical creatures is um it's a colored pencil uh, project. And what we do is we take a local illustrator. We, Alexis St. John, I don't know if, do you guys remember Alexis St. John? She was local, but she's moved back to Seattle now, but um, she, she initiated it. It's probably been eight years since we've done it. And you, it's basically how, what's like, how do you develop a character for a story? So we take a children's author who is also an illustrator, which we found is Sarah Turner from Tacoma. She's great. And uh, she will take kids through how to develop a character. And that's very free form. It's wonderful because they just have to take shapes and um, 
she teaches them how to build it out so it doesn't look like a stick figure and you know that sort of thing so it's basically you know shapes pencil techniques how to develop a story um and uh, storybook illustration and marla the how long does each child spend on one of these projects it sounds like it's just a one session one and done right you, from yeah, exhibition and composition and um the supervisor's time and whatnot it, it, how much time are they spending before they have the final product so you want to do it in two hours or less so basically it's film kindergartens three to five three to five minutes uh three through five is four to eight you know depending upon what the topic is and then what we do is we film have any of you watched any of our films no i will no so go so if you go to it so we have the opening where you talk about for instance with um let's say watts towers we do the whole talking about watts towers so pictures talk about vernacular architecture simon rhodia you know how we did it then we introduce we go straight into introducing the guest artist and they're like hi i'm you know Marla Morgan, and I'm going to be your guest artist for the Watts Towers. They were so excited to have you with us. Let me tell you a little bit about myself. So the guest artist talks about themselves for, you know, one minute, and then they go into how to do the project. And what we've learned is that if you take the project and you break it down, so he does a little bit and he goes, okay, let's see how you do. And we have a screen saver that says, now's the time to have your students do this. And so they do the first part of their project and they turn the film back on. So it's really interactive with the artist who is who is telling them when to start and stop and so you'll see that especially with the fishing boat you know it was really really interesting she taught them how to do it by shapes the the, the hull of the boat is more like a rectangle the masts make a triangle you know so um we're always trying to incorporate uh that sort of extra learning as well so when we do the warm and cool colors for the gram gamma graph for the k through twos it will show red with the word red underneath it so there's visual and you know word recognition with each of those things um, really trying to make it a great tool for the teachers hmm. Hmm. great wow and it's it's so amazing what you do. It's just such a gift <laughs> to the schools. The 4,000 some kids, are those um, elementary and junior high or elementary and middle school? No, K through five. K through five, okay. And next year we'll have uh, 12 schools participating, 10 of public elementary schools and two of the private schools do our curriculum. Is there, is there a way that homeschool kids can tune into this? Um, yeah, actually, I have a group of homeschool kids that in a, in a normal world, would they would, they're kind of like my test kids. They, I do a big class with homeschool kids prior to the film being done when we're testing it out and they give feedback and they, um, they basically figure it out how we're gonna do it. So that's been really fun with them. Great. Um, any, any other questions? Yeah, Marla, just um, overall, I know that you've asked um, several other agencies to support this work. Um, have you received um, other support for this project from any of the, the agencies that you've listed? For whimsical creatures or? I don't know. I, oh, any, any or all I'm sorry. Yeah, for any or all of them. So a gamma graphs is in this fiscal year for us. Mm -hmm. So I have received funding for quite a, a lot of this year because I've, you know, I've did it. Yeah. we're in the middle of it. And next year I'm just starting to advance for next year. It's 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 you kind of never know, you know, like this year we had four main sponsors that couldn't participate because they're either not open, they're not making any money, they can't give any money if they don't make any money. Um, but then we got additional relief from Washington State Arts Commission through COVID relief because of all the extra packaging we needed to send it home. So it's, you know, it's a constant, it's a constant ask. So um, 
I can tell you who has donated this year if you want. I mean, Washington State Arts Commission, Paisecki Family, Perot Family, MJ Foundation. Um, um, I don't know, right off the top of my head, I'd have to look it up. For your, just FYI. Oh, yeah. go ahead, Samantha. Oh, I was just gonna say for like, I guess you're in, what do you call it? Fiscal year 2021. I don't know how y'all do your fiscal year, but this school uh -huh. year, um, what percentage of funding have you secured for, for the projects that you ran for, that ran and are running for this fiscal year? For this year, um, we've raised, I'm right at 40, I think 41,000 for this year. So I'm getting pretty close. Okay, good. Congratulations. Thanks. Um, just for transparency, I'm also in the Washington State Arts Commission, Marla. So, uh -huh. um, so I just wanted you to know that because I was involved in the previous, your other grant, but- um, Thank you. You're welcome. But also I wanted you to know that they've, in case you're not aware, they've put out another round of uh, relief. Yeah, grants. I'm in the middle of doing that one right now too. So I just keep, I just keep going because I- Because you I have to <laughs> yeah, I keep thinking, I mean, the Piseckis have been amazing. I think they're on their eighth year of giving 10,000, but I, their kids are getting ready to go to college and I'm just waiting for that, that ball to drop. <laughs> Maybe. Oh, wow. You know, <laughs> they're well, so amazing about contributing, especially to educational things. Oh, I know. I know. I, I mean, I, everybody is. And I feel like that's why I also feel like I don't, you know, I don't go all out of all these places. I just go with what I think is is needed. And, um, you know, Pinnacle School Education Foundation, that's another one that every year donates to us. It's just been wonderful. It's hard for them because they can't do their fundraiser. And, you know, it's just a domino effect. <laughs> so I well, appreciate what you guys can do. You know, we're, we're here. I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> I just also want to say I'm impressed with the diversity of choices this year. Um, so uh, in the programming, it looks like you've done some of these before, but, um, but if you've done them before, you do them all over again, the video with a new artist, right? So. Well, we don't, so our, our structure, and if you think about our program as a whole, which is really exciting, we have a six year program, a six year cycle. So in six years, you are, you've gone through all of your kids from kindergarten through fifth grade. So on that seventh year, you could start all over again and you're, you're hitting all new kids. So we don't repeat a project for six years. And by that time, which is funny, cause you know, we'll say, oh, we've done a film before, you know, but we've, we've expanded, you know, we've, we've went from, we started out with just a PowerPoint and then we went to a PowerPoint and an artist film. And then we went to Oh, well, let's put them together. And then we went to let's do two different age levels. And so after six years, what we found out is even though we've done a project maybe a couple times, the technology is so different for the film and for the for the delivery of it that we have to do it over again anyway, because it's it's obsolete, which is kind of sad. I mean, it's just everything's going so quickly. Yeah. That you, yeah. you can't keep it, keep it going. So anyway. Yeah, we do it all. We do that over and we find a new artist and we let them have a different take on it, you know. <clears throat> do you know what the word agamograph uh, means? Like, I had never heard of that. Um, agamograph was a word, was a was a type of art um, kind of cloned by Yakov Agam, which is the artist. And he made agamographs, which were these pictures that changed as you Right, as, I was just well, wondering the word itself. Like, yeah, I, I, I'm thinking he made it up or he- Yeah. It might have some Hebrew in it, I don't know. I, I'll ask, I'll Here, find it for you yeah. and I'll, I'll ask Mark. I must know, no. Yeah. Well, you know, we have Marla for another, I think um, 15 minutes, so. No, I was gonna, I don't know if she knows Hebrew, but Mark speaks. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> um, I was also curious about the Watts Towers, um, here it is, I'll tell, you, I'll tell you right now, and a gamma graph is a series of images that change at different angles. This work is named after the Israeli sculptor Yaakov Agam, who was born in 1928 and is still living. 
they, um, they walk from one side to the other to watch their creation change. So it's just exactly what, you know. Oh, yeah, like you said, okay. The, the they, name of the guy yeah. that invented it. Cool. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, and the, the Watts powers, um, this sounds obvious, but I know you send some, you're, you, you provide some of the elements. Do kids, are kids uh, inspired to bring their own uh, elements to it as well if they're at home or any other, other fun things they can add to it? Yeah, you know, next year is still really up in the air. In a typical, in a typical world, we would have a big bin where kids could grab what they wanted and they could bring stuff from home and they could share it. I don't know what next year's gonna look like. So it might be that they have a set mixed media baggie that they get from us with wire and they complete it in class and then they can add to it when they get home. You know, like it's, it's kind of one of those things. What I'm really excited about is that this year, because we were able to let them keep their materials. So for instance, with the pen and ink, they got to keep that pen. So if they did their fishing boat and then they decided they really liked pen and ink, they wanted to try the technique, you know, that's really what we're trying to do is give them the experience of the technique and the materials and have them go off and do their own thing and continue. Yeah. So that's what's exciting with this year about having, you know, the materials go home with them. Yeah. And the other exciting thing that I liked about it was that typically when you'd have the film in class, the teacher sees the film, the kid sees the film, and the parent volunteer sees the film, one, two, or three, how many are volunteering that day. But this year, when they were all going home, all the parents really got to see the videos too, or got to it, like kind of watch. And so I'm hoping it gave us a lot more exposure out in the community as well. Yeah. Well, I think there's a lot of opportunity for us talking about community exposure like you if you have the videos online and you have a materials list people could do this at home right just like following along yeah we want to keep it a little bit proprietary for our year so we can do it again if we need to <laughs> in six yeah, how do you, so how do you avoid that if okay so so the instructional videos are you're are, all open they're all out there for this year. There's no, there's no login or anything. Once this year's done, it goes into our archive, which is then password protected. So oh, got it. Yeah. Yeah. And if somebody, if somebody will, I get people emailing me all the time. Hi, can I, I want to do the project from blah, 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 blah. And I give them a password and they go in and do it. So it's, it just lets me know what's going on a little bit yeah. more. <laughs> oh, that's great. Excellent. That's wonderful. I, any, any other questions? Any other questions or discussion? No, I don't have any questions. Dan, I'll uh, who, 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 there was a there was a man. I haven't heard from him. He had a question. <laughs> I know he did because he asked why I did three grants in your pre meeting. I like it. I like the whole project. So I, I have no questions. I, <laughs> I I know some I just, of the artists that you're talking about, and uh, it's really great. And have kids do it, I think is perfect. Yeah, it's fun. It's it's really, really rewarding. I I I I get a real just sense of, you know, I get tired and I'm getting old and my back hurts. But you know, <laughs> Let's I not I have, talk about old, okay? <laughs> but I, I have parents come up to me and they just um they'll send me, I don't know if you look at our Facebook page ever, but you know, I have somebody post um look at, we just redid our, our basement and we have our hands on our wall and they've just got a wall of everything they've done in hands on art or they've done the salmon project twice. And they're like, you're going to do it this year, right? Because I have three kids and I want my third salmon to be oh. hanging here in the trilogy. So oh. I know that it's, uh, I know that it's appreciated out there, which makes me carry on. <laughs> Excellent. Cool, cool, cool. Great. Any any other discussion? Marla, thank you so much. Thank you for all you do. And also, just on a personal note, thank you so much for all your support for our comprehensive plan amendment. Yes. Yeah. That was pretty awesome. That was crazy. I'm so sorry I couldn't stay on that committee. It was just really hard time-wise during the week, but I, I couldn't believe it. I'm like, there is no way these people are putting in all that work and somebody wants to table it 2024 like this is not right <laughs> letters you got but i got everybody all fired up yes 
<laughs> I think that must have been yeah, the most. Thank you. Thank yeah. You. That's got to be some of the most. I think we had, we had uh, 20 or some letters that were sent. Yeah. 20. And uh, at least. Good. They didn't, they didn't read them all, which I thought was sort of unfair, but they read three, oh. three or four of them. And um, um, may, they probably didn't read them because it would have taken probably half an hour right. to read all the letters, but thank you. So much. Yeah. Thank you. Well, you guys are wonderful. Thank you. And, I uh, had a really long night ahead of you. So, you know, whatever you can do is greatly appreciated. And if you come up with any other questions or if you have any artists that you know, if you have any ideas, let me know. I'm always hunting for, for good things out there. It's good stuff. Fantastic. Thank you. Thanks. Appreciate it, guys. Thank you. See Bye. You. Bye. Bye. I don't know how to get out of here. <laughs> uh, Bye. Bye. Okay, we have about four minutes, five minutes before the next one. If anybody needs to take a little quick break, this would be a good time. Um, is uh, Samantha here yet already? Molly? Stephanie, yes. Stephanie. I'm sorry, Stephanie. Yes, Stephanie. <laughs> there she is right there. Uh, <laughs> does anybody want to start early on? The next one. Sure, I'm okay. Uh, yeah, I'm okay with that. Yep. Because yeah. Seven minutes. So Charlie. Yeah. Should I? Is it okay for me to be here for this one, or what's the what's the protocol oh, sure. for? Sure. Okay. We're not voting on anything today. We're not okay. voting. Yeah. I just want to make sure that I'm doing things right. So. <laughs> I think, and even if we do vote. Um, I think that the rules for recusal are if you're going to benefit in any way financially, then you have to recuse yourself. But Molly will make sure that we understand what those That's are. And Molly keeps us all in line. Yeah. <laughs> we, couldn't, we couldn't function without Molly. <laughs> okay, thank you. I'm to retire. <laughs> Hi, Stephanie. Hi there. How's it going? Hi, Steph. Hi. Do you mind starting a couple minutes early? Not a bit. Hey, Stephanie, nice to see you. You too. Good job on all, and Samantha's here, and oh. Liv's here, and Dan, and Molly. Hi, everybody. Wait a minute. Hello. Okay. Thank you Hello. for all your support yeah. for, the F, for that and your kind words. Appreciate oh, absolutely. Yeah. Did anything happen oh. with the advocacy stuff? Uh, I'm sorry, what? Oh, nothing. It's OK. It, different topic for Robin. So <laughs> oh. Oh. we'll have to zoom. Yeah. That's what we do nowadays. <laughs> That's right. I'll zoom you. Yeah. Great. <laughs> okay. Well, tell us about the window exhibits. Okay. So I know that you have seen the application, but essentially, you know, one of the things we discovered during COVID was that we really wanted to turn the museum inside out. When we had to close last March, we were closed for about four months. And um we thought, gosh, you know, there's so many people still out walking, still getting around town. Uh, we really have to do something to figure out how to like literally turn this museum inside out so that it can still in engage people even though we're closed. And I drove in one day and I looked at all the windows across the front of the museum and I thought, that's ridiculous. They're not doing anything. <laughs> and so um, we actually uh, uncrated the Bomber Boys exhibit and put it in the windows, uh, the large canvases and the text panels that went with them. And uh, it was just a huge hit and people would stop and read and thought, well, this is a great way to engage people that are just walking by. And so um, that was coupled then with the um, Harbor Mystery Museum site that we set up. It was supposed to be just a temporary thing for quarantine. And of course it still lives on. <laughs> and so in some cases we were able to couple the stories that were related to the window exhibits with uh, longer editorial stories that were on the Harbor Mystery Museum site. And so that just turned out to be such a fun thing. And in the back room, in the resource room, we put in some of the panels from the Salmon Saners and Life on the Sea exhibit, as well as a model of the Julia B. fishing boat that was donated to the museum. So, you know, walkers could see 
more things in the windows of the mu of the museum. And this was completely just let's just do something quick so that we can kind of continue to engage the public. And with this project, we we want to build on the success of that and actually be able to uh, create exhibits that are specially designed for the windows. That means things that have a little larger font so that people can actually read them uh, from a farther distance. So, you know, it's a little different in the outside world versus the inside world in terms of um, readability for things, but also to have some visual impact as well. And to really just like invite people and to, to engage with the museum, even though we're not open all the time, you know, we're open three days a week right now and probably will continue that schedule for most of the rest of the year. But with the window exhibits, one of the uh, ideas for this came about when uh, we're in the middle of the Maritime Gallery uh, uh, concept design for that particular space, but we're also looking at doing some renovations in our main gallery. And part of that gallery is devoted to, uh, you know, there's a Native American section there, but there's a big uh, three pane window that's right in that kind of hallway gallery that the exhibit designers suggested doing kind of a, a window box treatment to or a, a light box treatment. And I thought, well, that's kind of cool. And then with the recent designation of the Tualcus estuary, that would allow us to uh, put our land acknowledgement as part of that, that kind of window exhibit and explain some of the history of this area uh, and, the, and the native story. So th those are all these different kind of interesting ideas that we've played with in terms of the window exhibits. And they would have a very similar kind of look and feel to them uh, graphically, but the content would vary from, from window to window. So for example, by the big anchor that is at the bottom of the stairs, uh, that would have a window panel that would explain that anchor and uh, show an, an illustration of the context of how those anchors uh, appeared on schooners that uh, once sailed in this area. And then um, the, the um, I, again, uh, sorry, <laughs> I mean, it's a long day. Uh, I, I sent a sample of what the uh, Jesse Watson artwork would look like um, in the three panel version. So that was a sample that was submitted with the application to give you a sense of what that might look like from the illustrated version. So we have that artwork in our collection. It was specifically created for the museum. So uh, that's kind of a cool story on the fishing side of things. So there's different topics, but uh, the windows are in some cases far apart. And so we have the triptychs that are kind of one set. And then we have the, the longer ones that would be the anchor and the narrows bridge and the um, World War II, Gig Harbor and World War II. Uh, those would be on the, the sort of the main office windows so that uh, people could see those up close and there'd be some relevant object that was related to them. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that the big catch statue that's out in front of the building is actually based on a historical photograph. And so we thought it would be cool to do a panel that included that original photograph as well so that people could make that direct reference. Um, so the other really cool thing that's developed since I, I uh, submitted the application is that um, the University of Washington Museum Studies Certificate Program had contacted me and they have a student that is looking for a practicum project who has graphic design background. So I thought, well, isn't that perfect? <laughs> so um, she's really excited to come on board and, and help with this project as well. So that would be a really great experience because this would definitely be one of our first um, practical museum uh, exhibit projects. So that's... Uh, it's a, it's a very simple, straightforward project, but obviously uh, with panels that are so large, I mean, they range from 70 inches high and by about 36 inches wide to 50 by 53. So they're, they're fairly large and um, they have to have, you know, a certain look and feel. So graphically, it's not super easy to make something that would actually be really appealing for, uh, for outdoor use and to hold up, you know, we, we would produce them on a rigid board that would actually set right into the window. And that way um, they would be uh, kind of uh, 
resistant to damage by sunlight. Uh, they would be reusable. Uh, that's a kind of a cool feature is that they could be uh, resurfaced and reused again. If we want to do another exhibit uh, with different content, we can still use the same materials. We just reprint them. So uh, there's some versatility there, which is really nice. And almost all of these windows have shades over them anyway. So let's see, why not let's activate them? So that's kind of. Hmm. Stephanie, I'm curious. So is the, the different panels um, are you doing, are you, is it like a commission? Are you going to have from your example? So an artist designs them and then you print them on a large scale or are they, you know, so some could be potentially in watercolor and then they'd be printed or oil or even just typography and photos or what, what is the end kind of visual? Yeah. Well, you know, I will be candid and say that I don't really have the resources to be able to commission artists to do individual panels just because that can get, you know, to, to pay them what they're worth, it can get very expensive. Uh, we happen to have the Jesse Watson art already in the collection. So that is one that that is a great example of something that we we want to feature things from our collection if we can, uh, because obviously we're a museum and we want to let people know what's here. But um, in some cases, like with the, the big catch photograph, uh, we don't happen to have that in our collection. It's at the Washington State Historical Society. So we would have to license that image from them in order to use that. So the, the design work that would actually be done in this practicum is designing uh, the consistency of the exhibit uh, so that there's typographical consistency as if it was its own exhibit. You know, it just happens to be that it's outward facing instead of inward facing. And, and in some cases they would actually be double-sided because there's a couple of windows uh, right at, in the entrance of the museum where the bridge pieces are, where we actually want to create a context for those pieces by including historical images of the bridge in its disarray. So you could actually get a sense of like, where this piece might have come from. And those could be double-sided facing outward and inward so that you get a, a better sense. It would create a context for both the big catch sculpture on one side and the bridge on the other. So this would be more of a, uh, well, I mean, honestly, it's a, it would be a design project uh, and uh, historic research and uh, the application of artistic skills with historic content to create a user experience. So it's kind of multidimensional in that way. The universe gave you a gift with that student, huh? <laughs> yeah, I hope so. <laughs> I hope she's as great as she seems. So. <laughs> awesome. That's great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and any other questions? Um, why, why would you not consider... Um, doing the uh, Native American one instead of- Oh, actually it's in it. Yeah, there is one in the set that is a Native American one specifically. And it talks about the original Squabops people that lived here, as well as the name of the site and um, and our land acknowledgement that the museum has, has recently adopted. So there would be that, and that would actually be a big triptych and that would be a double-sided one that would be outward facing to the parking lot, but also inward facing to the native gallery. And it would be flanked on either side by the cases that have uh, baskets as well as stone implements that uh, some of which were found on the site. So, so yes, good. we haven't overlooked that part. Yeah. Thank <laughs> My, you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> kind of important, yeah. I, I, I mean, I, I would vote for that instead of big catch, but you know, that's well, just my own bias. Yeah, I mean, quite honestly, if if we have to pick and choose, that is one that would have uh, more, uh, probably would get prioritized more than big catch. But we have multiple sets of uh, triptych windows, and I, I, I honestly did the big catch as a sample. Uh, because it was easy to be honest. <laughs> I had it, I had the, all the graphic components so I could make a sample really fast. But I also wanna give the student the opportunity to you know, actually bring her, her skills and her view to the project so that she gets a good experience out of putting this together as well, so. Well, Great. for what it's worth, I would second what Charlie said about um, the uh, indigenous 
story versus the uh, um, the big catch because I know just enough about the big catch um, that I wasn't involved when it when it was being um, developed. But I isn't it n not really a, a gig harbor story? It's yeah. It's not actually a fisherman, it's a cannery worker. It wasn't in Gig Harbor or where Seattle it was in Alaska. It was in Bellingham, actually. Okay, Bellingham, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so I just. Well, yeah, it's just a different part of the building. So, yeah, I mean, I, I totally understand what you're saying. If we have to prioritize uh, in our, you know, topics that are in or out, you know, based on uh, resources that are available, obviously we would pick the panels that are most relevant to current topics. Yeah. Thank you. Great idea. It's a great idea, Stephanie. Yeah. Thank you. Really, really. Is it now, is it gonna block all the light from inside uh, <laughs> coming in? Yeah, really. <laughs> Not kind of, but it uh, kind of already is blocked anyway. So <laughs> it's like, well, would you rather have a cool, informative, inspiring, you know, image, or would you rather have a big black shade, you know? So I prefer the big, inspiring, informative image as opposed to the big black shade. So. <laughs> Great. Great. Great yeah. any, any other questions for Stephanie? Um, the material you're using, the central board, uh, mm -hmm. it, um, are you sure it won't warp in the sun? Um, I've actually used it quite a bit and depending on the thickness and how it's installed, yeah. uh, you can keep it from warping. Those windows do get pretty warm in the summertime. Uh, warm, the, yeah. the other images that we used were on stretched canvas. I was a little worried about them fading. So uh, they were not up as long as they could have been. But Sintra is a, a, a it's either Sintra or Aluma board. And I've actually done some outdoor graphics with those materials and that print technique that have held up remarkably well. So okay. I am not too worried about them. Yeah. I just want to be sure you considered that because yep. that is a problem. It can be a problem. Yeah. Between the sunlight and the heat, it can really be an issue. Yeah. Well, and I'm glad to hear that because I first read that as Sinatra board and I was like, <laughs> when you walk by, it sings. <laughs> so when it gets lost, it starts to sing. I did it my way. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Well, the nice thing is that it can be cut to size very specifically. Yeah. And, you know, these windows are not your typical 24 by 36, which almost all our material is about that size. And uh, so having them custom fit, they fit right into the window frames without any damage to any surrounding areas or anything like that. So they just go, you know, and you can even suction cup them and not hurt them, <laughs> which is nice. <laughs> yeah. Great. Right. Wonderful. Any other questions? Any other discussion? No, just I think it's a thoughtful uh, solution to the fact that that you all keep having to close every five minutes with COVID precautions. And there are so many people out and about. Um, oh, yeah. Of course, you're not open 24 hours a day anyway. So I think it's a, an, That's right. I love this idea of flipping the museum inside out. Yeah. Well, we have so many cool things here and great images and they just need to be shared more. And sometimes it's not all on a computer screen. Sometimes it's actually something really cool that you see when you're out and about. So I figure let's just turn these boring windows into something interesting. Yeah. Wonderful idea. Thank you so much. But thank you for um, the opportunity. Okay. I guess um, I guess you're done. Okay. Well, thank We're you very much. Out. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Stephanie. I can hear other people's projects. Is it okay if I stick around? Yeah, you can stick around. Okay. You yeah, you can hang around and eavesdrop if you want. Okay. Or, or cheerlead from the sidelines, even though you won't see me, but I'll be cheerleading. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Great. Thanks so much. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. We are two minutes and 15 seconds away from cruising and bruising. <laughs> <laughs> what happened to Stephanie? Uh, she she said goodbye. Oh oh, I thought she wanted to stick around. Oh she, she's there, but she's just not oh. visible. Oh, no. is that how this works? Yeah. Oh. Uh, no, I think I don't think she's there. Is oh, she, dear. I think she might have to join again because yeah. I didn't have the option just to take her out. Once you've been brought in as a panelist, you can demote somebody.
I tried and oh. it said remove. So sorry, Stephanie, call back in. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. Well, she, she, can, she can click the link and join back in if she wants. Are we ready for Drew? Um, I, I'm ready. Is everyone ready for cruising and bluesing? <laughs> yes. Okay. Here we go. Okay. <clears throat> Hi, Drew. Welcome. There you are. Oh. Um, can we no, hear you I, uh, play something? Can you hear anything? Can you hear something now? There you go. We can barely hear you. All right. Let's see. Let's try that. Is that is that? That's better? better. That's that way better. better. Okay, great. Great. Well, uh, I think uh, that Cameron is here, too. Is he in the waiting room? Potentially, I think he, he's a member of the band and he wanted to, or I wanted to him to come and if you guys wanted to ask him any questions, he could be here. Okay. Great. Well, I guess I'll just get started then. Um, so we are a local organized band. That's Cameron. Um, Hello. We Hi, Cameron. Welcome. In, um, I think it was 20, 2018. Uh, we were just a small five person group. Um, and people really liked what we were doing and so we expanded the group started playing mostly at swing nights uh downtown on tuesdays and they started expanding things and we got asked to do a wedding and blah 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 so we just love what we do we love to play and just be in front of people making music you know it makes people happy and it makes us happy to play for people so um we are organizing a event um at a restaurant um, it's, it's just a concert right uh, we are looking for an outdoor space um, one that I had in mind was uh, the Zox at on Fox Island by the gas station there uh, just as an outdoor area um, we would need to uh, rent the space from them um, to be able to host that concert right um, and with that I'm sorry hold on I Okay. So, so the idea is to attract people to this restaurant and to kind of in, encourage support for the restaurant. We're not organizing a fundraiser and there's no charge for the concert itself, but we just, you know, we want to encourage support for them as uh, the, 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 the food industry has been affected so much because of this uh, pandemic. Um, and for that night, we intend to rent some equipment um, to have or to be able to project our sound properly and get it actually recorded on audio and use it for advertising for ourselves um, so and the reason we want to just do this is because we feel that providing this concert for the community is just a, fa a fantastic way to just give back because the community has supported us so much and we've been really thankful uh, personally I just it's kind of incredible to see all of these people that I was listening to on all the projects and everything. And like the hands-on art project, I still remember doing some of those things. And I think my mom still has one of those in her office at work <laughs> and whatever. So things like that. And, you know, so just people like that have supported us. And so we just want to get back by providing, um, with that, uh, we just, uh, we, uh, intend to adver advertise through social media platforms, potentially posters um and the date for the concert right now is a tentative date of july 2021 because we just kind of categorized that month uh because of covid right we, we don't want to do anything in case you know cases are on the downtrend but we don't want to do anything that would you know not be okay and then we wouldn't be able to host the event so we're just we're waiting until it's kind of a, an okay thing to do that um other than that, uh, am I, I don't know if I'm able to share a screen. I think I can. I'll just show you, you something that we did this summer on Fox Island. Is we just kind of, okay, I can't, but I will show this. Uh, so this summer we were able to play a neighborhood concert on Fox Island. Uh, this was, we got put into the paper that was uh, written for that month and they just, people loved us and it was, it was just a fantastic event, and we were just so excited to do that thing. Um, 
yeah, other than that, I think it should be a pretty fun uh, and effective event and should be community, community engaging and all that fun stuff. So, How many people um, were at this, the event at Fox Island? Um, so, hmm. this summer, you know? Well, it was, so it was a neighborhood concert. I believe we had anywhere from 30 to 50 people. I didn't actually go to take a count. It was small. We just kind of did it in a small neighborhood and people loved it. So it was, it was just a fun, engaging event and for, to give people some COVID relief, if you know, if you know what I mean. And then we did the same thing in uh, my neighborhood as well later on in the summer. And then people just loved it there too. Yeah. And if I might pop in on that, yeah, that was, um, we were super excited to do that. It was at when COVID hit, we just, you know, couldn't play at all. And so we kind of got the idea as people were coming back from college during the summer, like, Hey, let's just hang out in my driveway, we'll post something on like the Fox Island news on Facebook. Like that was the only bit of advertising we did for that. And yeah, I mean, people just like heard it from their homes and came outside and would come up to us and be like, hey, we're like, we haven't heard music in so long. And it was yeah. so nice to just see, you know, kids out there doing that. Um, yeah. So yeah, especially with the the restaurant, we want to just kind of just revive um, music and um, being together in Gate Harbor. Yeah. Do, do you have an idea which restaurant you might be um, looking at? Yeah, we are. Uh, I'm looking at the Zox on Fox Island. Yeah. I think your Zogs, I think it is. It's it's uh, it's got a really large outdoor space. So it would be kind of ideal for what we're looking for. Okay. Yeah. Um, Drew, uh, I, do you have 11 musicians now is there a let are there 11 musicians in your band or are you I, my question i wrote down was is this one performance or is it one big band or is it multiple performances by various correct so yeah. so this is one performance with all 11 musicians in the band we have Oh. four rhythm section and then five horns and two vocalists cool oh yeah super cool okay and zogs um zogs i've been there a couple times is it it's family friendly right it's not just it's, yes i believe so okay yeah that's the idea is to have this a family friendly event. right perfect okay yeah. And now, oh, sorry, one more question. It, you said 500 dollars to rent the space is that normal do they usually because zogs has live music there i didn't do bands normally have to pay to rent a, to use the space? So um, I couldn't find anything online, whether I just kind of assumed that we were probably going to have to rent the space because we're the ones hosting this event. Technically, uh, we will still need to communicate with them a little okay. bit on this project, right? And once things open up more, because we just really don't have an idea at this point in the game, just because okay. of, you know, things are so up in the air. Um, I just kind of allotted that as it, so it might not be that amount at all. It could totally be, or it could totally be free, uh, but we will just have to kind of see. And I just kind of had that as a safety net, okay. if that makes sense. Okay. Yeah. And if I might touch on that too, um, and correct me if I'm um, wrong, Drew, but Zogs isn't like set, like set in stone. That's just kind of an idea we have. That's, that would, that's the kind of place that we want to be. And we know that, um, um, I mean, we've been to Zogs. We know that's a great place to have that, but um, we're, we're always open to suggestions on where we can do it. But that's that's an idea that it's not set in stone. Correct. Yeah. Um, so when you've done those, um, when you did the outdoor concerts last year, um, did you have sound equipment or were you just live? Uh, we we had we have very limited sound equipment that is not effective um it's it was just both times things just were not working with microphones and stuff and it, it just it was not happening the band uh itself sounds i in my opinion i think they sound pretty good but it just it definitely inhibits us a lot um so we are hopefully if we can gig enough this summer we we're hoping to save up and invest um, in some new equipment for ourselves, but this rental equipment for this one would definitely provide a proper, you know, experience for our um, audience. Right. Um, so Guitar Center, is that in Tacoma? Yes, it is. Um, there's a place called um, Mainline Music in Port Orchard. 
that really? rents okay. rents sound gear too. And you might just um, shop around, get three bids, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and thank I'm, you. I didn't know. I have never heard of them, so I will I'll write their name down before I forget. And oh, um, mainline music is that what it was? Mainline, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like music on the main line, tell us what you want. Jesus on the main line. I mean, um, and there's a place, there's an audio place in Gig Harbor. Lynn or Robin, do you, does anybody remember that one? Um, and I think audio. Yeah, they're right on, um, right across from, uh, uh, right down there. Right down the street from the, what is that place called where the Judson. art fair is held? Yeah, Judson, Judson. Judson Street. Yeah, Judson, yeah, they're right on off Judson. And and do they rent um do they rent sound gear? I don't think so. I don't they think do, so. They do installations of they do more installation of sound equipment. Yeah. Is my understanding. Yeah, they're, they're like a hi-fi store sort of stuff, but it's worth asking them. You never know. They might even sponsor or something, you know. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I mean, it's always and, worth them. And another place that you should ask is All-Star All -Star Guitar, All-Star Academy. Yes. Um, they so recently I... have changed ownership. Um, yeah. And I know that um, Dan and May that used to own it had all kinds of sound gear and would provide sound gear for local events, including outdoor events. Um, so, and I'm not sure if they still do, but that's another place to ask another possible sponsor. Yeah. Cause it's, yeah, that makes sense because it's local and you're supporting local businesses as well. So that, thank you for that. I will right. also contact all star and see what, so Drew and Cameron, we're, we're, we're punting some suggestions to you all to help you. If we are unable to fund this um, proposal at the full amount of 5,500, um, if we were only to award like a partial fund, like half of it or something, would you be able, would you pursue additional funding to be able to put this on? Or would you just have to give the money back and be like, no, we're not going to do this project? I think that we would uh, do our best to make the event happen no matter what, uh, whether that includes additional funding, whether that's just the funding that you guys are able to provide us, because uh, I think it's just important that we are able to do this event more than anything else. I, per, Yeah, that's the personally the way I feel about that. Yeah, no, we all miss live music and we all miss community and we all miss restaurants. Um, so no, it's it, it, it'll be great if we can if we can help make this happen. Um, but like everybody else, we also have a limited budget. So um, wanted to, to get that sense of what what your capacity is if, if we can't come in at full funding. Sure. No, that uh, that completely makes sense. Thank you. Right. It could be, it could be such a celebratory event, you know, to hear, here we can, we have all these things that we've been missing, that we've been craving. And um, um, yeah, let's just, I, it's, to me, the, the whole concept has some real potential for getting funding from, or sponsorships um, from a lot of different places. So um, let's all keep our thinking caps on and uh, if we can come up with other places where you know venues that wouldn't cost anything or um, other schemes places that might sponsor them uh, let's keep in touch with Drew and Cameron and um, see whatever we can do to encourage them and help them make it happen any other questions I, I have two actually. So kind of along that lines, if for some reason Zogs doesn't work out, like I, I don't know, of course, with the current restrictions, but hopefully when they're maybe lifted a little more like Scansy Park has the covered area. And then if people, if we're encouraged to get takeout from all the local restaurants, that would potentially benefit lots of restaurants in the, that area and maybe have a larger audience as well, a potential audience. And then kind of along that same lines, will there be a, are you anticipating having the capability to do like a Facebook stream, a uh, live sort of thing so more people could 
view that might not be able to make it to the venue that night? Well, um, I'm actually glad that you said that. I think that's something that we could totally make happen. Uh, I don't know if you all know Chance Busey. He's a pretty active member in this town. And he's a, just a good person. He's uh, very uh, active in the Gay Cover High School band program, and I know him personally. Um, we could probably get him to put up a live stream for that, and we could communicate with him on that and ma to make that happen. It would be, cool. be great for lots of people to hear you guys. Yeah, awesome. thank you for that idea, too. Right. Um, Lynn. Yeah, uh, I had a few things. Um, first, I noticed your, just for your records, the musician payment is just miscalculated. 395 times 11 musicians is 4,345. Hmm. Um, and uh, these estimates from Guitar Center don't don't include tax. I don't know if these kinds of rental things are taxed, but that might be something you need to consider. Uh, okay. I, uh, I don't believe that they are, are taxed heavily or if at all. I, I do not remember seeing anything on tax. I, these estimates or the only way I could find them was through an over the phone call with a customer service person i had to call like three different locations to get those estimates and it just, it just was not very helpful so these were the best that i could come up with with what okay. i had okay so. yeah i just thought to keep in mind you know asking okay is there tax and whatever fees on top of that just so you know what you're full in it for right taxes mm -hmm. um and you had mentioned that you would probably uh advertise with posters and things like that but you don't have anything listed on this particular budget for that kind of expense for printing mm -hmm. and designing posters. So, um, yeah. So, um, and that is just a, a tentative, tentative idea of what we could, uh, of a way we could do that. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure we could figure something out for that as well. Okay. Um, and I, I guess I just wanted to remind you that when, when uh, you're selected to receive grant funding, you, we won't give you the money until it's, uh, you know, until you've already collected your receipts and everything and it's any events finished and then we get you just so you'll know you will have to put, you will have to put up the money first. Um, it's just good to know that. Okay. Thank you. I, I, I did acknowledge that or understand that when I went okay. through it. So I, I factored that into, I guess, my thinking process with this event. Okay. Now, I noticed you don't have anything here for travel. You got to pick the stuff up and bring it back, right? That's correct. Yeah, we just uh, load everything in our own vehicle. The only all, all this includes is the performance. Correct. So we, yes, we will just load the equipment up ourselves and do the work. Okay. That way. Thank you. Okay, everyone. We're at uh, oh. at six forty-five. So, That's it. Bruce and Cameron, if I move you out of there, and I kick you out, I apologize. <laughs> Please join again. I'm going to try and just put you on hold. I do not see moving you back as an attendee, but if you want to hang um, I'm going to hit so much. On hold and maybe that will work. No, I don't know where he went. Thank you for the time. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you Thank you, Cameron. Yeah. Oh, Cameron Gabe. Cameron Gabe. Must be Jennifer Gabe's son. Hey, oh, Marie. Hey. I found all your email in my junk folder. Oh, well. Move me out of your junk. <laughs> but you know, you never go into my junk. <laughs> out, out of it. Oh, she has a new email address. Yeah. Maybe oh. I'll fly. There's Jennifer Gabe. Jennifer, hey. was that, was that hey. your number? Was that yeah, your that, Yeah, that was my son. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Okay. Cool, cool. Nice. Hi, guys. <laughs> welcome. Welcome, welcome. Welcome. Thank you. We still, we still talk about you guys from last year, so. Oh, good. <laughs> it was so much fun. I yeah, it was so much more fun last year in person. <laughs> it, was, it was. It was. It was fun to have the kids there. I was um, actually just popped in um, yesterday or the day before on their Zoom class um, because we're trying to gather some information um, for the seniors. We're just trying to figure out some creative ways to kind of celebrate them um, during the springtime with uh, just different kind of things. So I needed some information from them because we we actually, even though the boosters is supporting the band, we actually, we can't have district information. 
Uh, Mr. Swanson can't share emails or anything with us. So everything that we get has to come directly from the families or the, or the students. Um, so there's a lot of times that I have to um, go in there and, and, um, and just, I used to love going into the band room and hear them play. <laughs> so it was a little weird going in on Zoom and, uh, and seeing them, but it was, uh, it was nice and it was fun. Um, to just, I popped in and, and watched uh, Drew and Cameron. So I just wanna thank you guys cause that's just um, really good experience for them um, yeah. to be able to, um, to do this. Um, so I just texted Drew, I was like, I'm proud of you, good job. <laughs> uh -huh. You did great. Yeah, so anyways, if you guys don't mind, I'm gonna um, start off by um, just sharing my screen. I just have a couple of pictures to show you um, to maybe uh, help you visualize um, kind of what we're what we're asking for here. So, okay, okay it says the host. Can, can I do that, Molly? Can I share my screen? It says host disabled participant screen sharing. Oh, I am now the co-host. Okay, I just made your co-host. You should be able to share your screen. Yep, now it's gonna do it. Okay, so let me get down here. I have a lot going on. Okay, so first I'm um, uh, just a thumbs up. Do you guys see this picture? Yeah. yeah. Seen? Okay, great. Um, so this was our last year's concert band on our stage at Gig Harbor High School. <laughs> this is just one band <laughs> and the seating that's in front of these kids doesn't even fit the amount of parents that come to our concerts. So we rarely, unfortunately, are able to use our facilities, um, especially now with COVID because these kids are gonna have to be spaced out. Um, and of course the parents, um, I know me for right now, even outdoor soccer, we're allowed one parent at a, you know, so, um, but even that wouldn't fit. Um, all of our bands. So this is the concert band, which is our beginning band. So those are mostly freshmen. Uh, this is our symphonic band. So it's our um, next level band, which would include um, sophomores, juniors, some seniors. And then this is our wind symphony, which is um, again, if they're advanced players, um, we've got some, so some sophomore juniors and seniors. So as you can see, and then this is our percussion. So percussion by themselves will fit nicely on our stage, <laughs> um, but the rest of our bands um, do not. So um, this is a big um, expense for us. We rent Chapel Hill over there for our concerts. This particular um, picture that you're seeing is um, the, one of the fundraisers slash concerts that we uh, that we run. It's called our American is Apple Pie. Um, that year, we were very fortunate to be able to, you see this rainbow colored tuba in the center of the stage right there. And you'll see to the, what, to the right or the left of it, I'm gonna reverse, um, uh, bald gentleman. That's Patrick Sheridan. He's the rainbow tubist. He's a, he's a pretty, um, famous uh, tuba player. He was in town up in Seattle doing an event and luckily Mr. Swanson um, had gone to one of his seminars so had made a connection there. And he came over to Gig Harbor and played the Flight of the Bumblebees with our band. Wow. wow. And so he also played a jazz piece with our jazz band. So that was pretty cool. That was, a, that was definitely a highlight for, um, for our kids that year. So, um, so what I'm showing you here is this is our this is just our symphonic band right here. And as you can see, um, they fill this stage pretty fairly well. Um, we unfortunately have lost probably about, I know we've lost uh, four seniors um, and uh, a couple of juniors. So our band's a little bit smaller this year, but um, this is the space that we're gonna need to be able to produce a concert. In addition to that, Chapel Hill is very um, uh, well prepared for um, recording of audio. Um, so, um, but of course, all of that, I mean, it's a beautiful facility and it needs to be paid for. So all of that comes with a fee. So there's a, 
there are separate fees just to rent or rent this hall, which is what we would be doing. We wouldn't be renting any additional um, spaces we have in the past for um, our jazz band. Um, this is just another view. So this is, I don't know if you've ever been in Chapel Hill, but this is the balcony. So you have that whole balcony area, then you have the seating down below, and then you have the stage. So, um, so we, uh, we regularly um, utilize this space, um, but we do pay for it and, and the district doesn't pay for it, the boosters pay for it. Um, and the, there's a separate fee. So there's a separate fee for the use of the facility. And then there's a separate fee for the use of the technology. Um, that mostly includes the person manning the technology, um, who, whoever is hired or whoever is, um, whoever is trained and hired, because of course the equipment is expensive and they want somebody who knows what they're doing. And that's fair enough. So, um, so that's kind of what, we just want to produce one concert this year. <laughs> That is our goal. Um, and that, of course, will be a concert for all bands. Concert band will have theirs. Symphonic will have theirs. Wind Symphony will have theirs. So um, so it's quite a, a, a long night. It's a quite a large rental for us. Um, but that, I mean, that that's it. That's what, this is our jazz band in one of their side rooms. Um, and we have... I think we're only going to have what two now, two two jazz bands. Um, whereas that year we had uh, we had six. So, um, but anyway, so that's another space we rent for jazz bands. Don't know if we're going to be able to manage a jazz band concert, um, but the jazz bands don't quite um, fill up the uh, the space. So I just want to go to uh, quick to the application here um, and the, the budget, I guess, more so. Um, so what, uh, what we're asking here is the rental facility, the um, charge for the um, personnel, the rental for a, the AV equipment, um, printing programs, and the commissioned piece of music that we would, uh, one of the pieces that we would play that night. So that comes about to $1,360. Um, I can already tell you, if we're, we're gonna produce a concert, um, whether we're gonna be able to have attendees or, or not is, you know, is gonna be in question. However, we will stream it live um, if we can't have attendees. So we know that at this point, we have acquired the PPE to be able to at least hold the concert. Um, so that's, uh, that's good news. Um, and we will do it regardless of funding. Um, the, the good part of the funding for us is that, um, as you see above, we have only brought in uh, about 2,500 in fundraising this year, which is still pretty good considering, um, considering the situation, but we usually run about a $20,000 budget. And, um, this year, I think we, uh, I think our bank balance is at 13,000. And what we're trying to do is maintain about 10,000 of that for when we can go back and start funding um, jazz festivals, uh, uh, the other festivals that we go to and Disney uh, Anaheim, which is one of the big festivals or traveling to Chicago. So we're trying to keep that fundraising money set aside so that when that does start happening again, we have the money to be able to fund it. Um, so yeah, that's, um, that is kind of, um, in a nutshell where we're at, um, and I'll go ahead and stop sharing my screen. Uh, thanks Jennifer. Um, just want to let everybody know we're at the five minute mark. So you, it's time to start asking questions. Right. Okay. So Jennifer, are, are you planning to rent Chapel Hill again? Is that the plan? Yep. Yep. We would, we would be renting Chapel Hill. We, we just, we can't do it at the high school. There's just not enough space. And Jennifer, um, whether you have audience or not, it sounds like you're prepared to do a live stream. Would you do live stream even if audience can go into the chapel? Yeah, we would maintain the live stream um, because for our families that either choose not to come or that are out of town. No, that's so good. That's so yep. good. And everybody misses seeing the students. Yep. <clears throat> Hi, Lynn. Hi. Hey, um, I was just curious about you. Oh, I'm 
forgive me if you mention this, but you okay. have the date down as May or June. I was just wondering why that window um, would, would you consider doing it later in the year? Um, no, the kids are just first June 19th um, is graduation. So, um, okay. and the reason why it would probably be in May is because they're just getting back to school two days a week on the 13th. So they're going to need that the full amount of time to prepare. Um, okay. Mr. Swanson is, is a very precise band director and like other schools, like released fight songs and stuff like that. He won't put music out there. That's not perfect. Yeah. Got it. That, that makes sense. It's the, the end of the school year. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. Thanks. What's the capacity? What's the capacity at Chapel Hill? Oh my goodness. Um, I think, so the, the jazz room was a max of 200. Um, I don't know what their COVID capacity is, but um, their, uh, their, uh, the hall that we were in the main chapel area um, was over 500. With COVID, it's probably 25 or 50% of that. That's what I'm thinking. I would recommend you do that regardless of what the <laughs> protocols yeah. are. Yeah. Yeah, it, yeah, I think what we would do is is limit it to one one parent so that we could get some some public in there that wants to come as well. Right. And is this uh, it's no charge, right? It's free admission. Yep. Yep. That's no charge. Right. Uh, any other questions? We're getting close to our time allocation. Well, are you going to include Gig Harbor's, um, the music of Gig Harbor, <laughs> under a Gig Harbor moon? <laughs> we talked about it last year. I poke Swanson all the time. I'm like, um, a theme. <laughs> right, right, yeah. No, I, I have no control of the music, but I do poke him. I will let you know. <laughs> yeah. What, what well, I would yeah. like to see is if we have a yeah. band participate in the Maritime in August, if we could actually put a band in that, I would like to see that happen. <laughs> Tell them we haven't forgotten. <laughs> I know, either have I. <laughs> we're, just, we're glad to hear that. Thank yeah. you, Jennifer. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, guys. Yeah, really. thank you so much. All right. <laughs> and I, as we're transitioning, can I, can I talk or does it boot me out as we're transitioning to the next person? Oh, no, you can talk. Okay, I just wanted to, I wanted to thank you because the um, at the networking thing the the question um, time we had um, oh. that led to um, another grant opportunity for us. Um, so oh. I just I wanted to thank you guys. So I have that application in um, for for some operating expenses. So thanks thanks for the connections. I appreciate it. Excellent, Very good. wonderful way to work it. Music should be all about connections. Art should be all about connections. Fantastic. Okay, next up is going <laughs> to be Gnomes Away From Home. Are they here, Molly? They are. The gnomes. There's Justin. Hello. We can, we can see Justin's <laughs> name. We can't see Justin. Uh, here, let me see. I just have to click this. Um, here you are. Now here here I am. <laughs> Can you hear me too? Dramatic fade in. <laughs> Hi, Justin. You like dramatic. Hi. Hey. <laughs> nice to see you, Lynn. Nice to see you finally. Yes. <laughs> okay, Thank you so for having me, everybody. <laughs> Tell us about Gnomes Away From Home. Uh, Gnomes Away From Home is a uh, community participatory storytelling project, which uh, is sort of like a multi-tiered treasure hunt. And unlike a lot of treasure hunts, which are geared towards children only, <laughs> Gnomes Away From Home is something that is truly designed for all age groups and developmental levels. And the way that we can pull that off is there are 20 treasure hunts within this game that occur. And there's a lot of room for flexibility because 
it can occur simultaneously or over time. So the idea is that there's 20 different known statuettes that are hidden in various locations around Gig Harbor. And um, basically I uh, have a website in which I develop clues and some, and I have examples of the clues tonight if you wanna hear them. And um, people follow the clues, find the gnomes. And when they find the gnomes, they, turn in their name and address on the website, along with a picture of a selfie of them with the gnome if they choose. And they get a $20 gift certificate to an area business um, and they get to keep the gnome. So how fun is that? And in addition to, the, to that as well, they get a letter from the family of the gnome thanking them for the rescue. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Just a little added plus one for everybody. Um, there's also an added component to the game um, where there are eight medallions and the medallions are spread out uh, throughout downtown after the gnomes have been found. And with each of the medallions, there's one word attached and collectively each of the medallions spell the phrase, um, Gig Harbor is great, long live Gig Harbor. So each person that finds a medallion has one little clue to the final riddle, but anybody can participate in solving the final riddle, uh, whether or not they find a medallion. So I wanted to include that component so that folks that for whatever reason are not able to participate in the treasure hunt can still participate from home uh, in some capacity. So that in a nutshell is Gnomes Away From Home. Okay. And the, the clues are published on, on your website. I think you said that and I'm sure it's in here, but. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, the clues will be published on the website and uh, publicity for the game and for the website, which is integral for the game to go on, will be through posters that are put up throughout town. Um, they'll kind of take the, um, the style of a, a missing person poster, but with a picture of the gnome on them. And I actually have an example here of the, this is what we're looking at. He's about uh, four inches high or so. And I'm trying to get all identical versions so that there's consistency. And then on the bottom, you, you it's upside down, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, you have the name of the gnome. And um, when the person finds the name of the gnome, they uh, mention that on the website and then that's how they get their gift certificate. That prevents people from just simply saying, oh, I found a gnome and then getting a random gift certificate. So it, it sounds very simple and like, it's the kind of thing that not a lot of work would go into, but <laughs> already uh, I've gotten a few of these and even just weatherproofing them and painting oh. the bottoms to make it so that I can write a name on them in <laughs> hours. <laughs> so oh, no. this, is, this is something that is a little bit more labor intensive than oh. you might think at first blush. So, but it's so much fun. And I think it's going to be uh, a lot of fun for the community. You said you had some clues that you, you would um, give us a, a, a clue about some of the clues? Yeah, would you like to hear one? Uh, yeah. You promise you won't tell anyone? Yeah, yeah. this is confidential, right? <laughs> oh, all right, okay, then I'll tell you. I'm gonna so, claim a prize, I'm gonna claim a prize. <laughs> so here's an example from uh, Wilkinson Farm Park. Um, and as an example, some of them are easier and some of them are a lot harder. And that's another way we can make it fun for everybody. So uh, south of the rose, there hides a vale, a village green, bottom of a hilly paved trail. On the north side of this fecund valley, there is fenced the fruits of toils recompense for planting of seed and tilling 
of this bounteous earth. Here, south of here on cedar chip trails in counterclockwise loops, always looking low and left to find that for which you search. Wow. Any ideas at all? <laughs> okay, I win. <laughs> <laughs> Any ideas where that might be? You said, Wilk did you say Wilkinson? Wilkinson? Oh, I did, okay. You said, okay. Uh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so um, here, here's an example of the other end of the spectrum of something that's really specific and it's for the same e exact uh, gnome. 10 paces from the wood chips, midst the holly, you'll find a little rosy cheeked fellow, Jolly. Walk over to the largest tree, look down at the base and his peaked hat, you'll see. And just so you uh, have an idea too that they don't all need to rhyme and I can't possibly make them all in iambic tameter or iambic pentameter, I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm not Shakespeare. <laughs> um, Here's an example of what some other clues might sound like too. Um, if you harbor no need for solitude, you'll find your way here. And then the answer is right under your nose. Wait for a sign, stop, plant your feet, have a look around. And then it goes all the way down to check the planter box. <laughs> so it eventually will just tell you <laughs> where to look if, if it doesn't get found. So I will progressively make it easier and easier. Does that kind of give you an idea of? Yeah, what if, what if somebody finds a gnome, they're just out walking, they find a gnome, they take it and they don't know anything about the, the treasure hunt? Um, well, that's a very good question. So what I intend to do along with the names, I will put a little rubber band around them with a tag that has a laminated piece of paper with a QR code on them. So they can scan that and find the website and hopefully they'll be curious enough um, or, or a web address so, something that will take them to the website. Okay, good. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Or even on your QR codes, if if found, or Scan. I'm lost, I'm lost. If you find me, please, you know, to Scan. something called action, right? To engage them into wanting to find out how to contact you. Yes, yes. exactly. Yeah. Justin, is this going to be on a, I'm, I'm scanning, but maybe you have this in the application, but it's going to be on a particular day. No, this is going to take place over a period of weeks and months. And it's really hard to pinpoint an exact time because it's just hard to say uh, how long it's going to take people to find them. Um, and as far as a start date, I'm shooting for between April and May, I'm intending to front end load a lot of the work because I want a lot of the clues and stuff written. I want the gnomes ready to go and the posters ready to go before I launch. Um, I, I'll be doing some of it on the fly, but um, I, I wanna do a lot of the prep work first. The other thing is that um, I'm partnering uh, with Kopachuk State Park as well, and they are in the midst of a capital project right now. And I kind of made a tentative promise that I would wait until they're finished up with that so that I can hide one there as well. So they were saying around April tentatively, they would be finished up with that too. Um, and they were very excited about the project, so. Okay. Well, I, the only reason I ask is, I mean, I, you know, I'm from the city originally, like I'm from Philadelphia originally, not just Seattle. And mm -hmm. I always think somebody's gonna steal the gnome and just, <laughs> you know, so I know that oh. might not be the, always be the case, but I just, when you have that long a time period, I wonder if they'll just disappear if people find them. So I was wondering if maybe by constraining it over a weekend or something, like geocaching, right? 
Um, mm -hmm. So, or geocaching, I think you find it, you get the combination and then you put it back or something, but um, I'm not a geocacher. I don't know the details, but I think you get my, my question. It's just that I think if, you know, would that be a consideration? Because then you could just do like gnome weekend or something. And if you did eight or nine of them and I'm make it more of a kind of weekend event. Is that possible or no? I, I gather this is you doing all of this, right? <laughs> uh, pretty much. My, my partner will be helping with some of it too. Um, but yeah, it's, um, uh, it's, it's whatever I can pull off. So it, it definitely would put limitations <laughs> on it to make it into like a, a one-time only event. And um I, I definitely hear what you're saying about like, the fear of them disappearing. And I think that's also why I wanted to attach um, gift certificates as a further incentive. I hate to make everything about money, but honestly, money talks. <laughs> and, you know, if people see that there's something else in it too, I, I think it just further incentivizes people to want to play the game. And so, Frankly, it just takes away people's motive to want to steal the gnomes if they're going to get something more out of it by turning it in and by playing the game anyway. Um, we could definitely do it as a weekend thing, but um, I'll, I'll be honest, part of my motivation for wanting to do it as a longer thing is because I've done treasure hunts before where I was really bummed that I missed out on it because it was just over and done with so quickly. But um, I, I definitely hear and understand your concern. Um, uh, so yeah, I was thinking, you know, with the QR card, you say, hey, um, claim your prize, you, you know, like, yeah, not, there's got to be some hook then. So if someone isn't just like swiping it, you're like, hey, claim your prize. You know, when you, if you found, you know, congratulations, you found you one found of the winning gnomes. Yeah. But, um, yeah, we'll scream I, that all over. We'll make it very readily apparent yeah, that they know, won something else. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you know what I, I like about it being, you know, um, carried over a, a longer period of time because, um, an event like this, unless you have a ton of marketing money to throw at it, um, people don't know about it. But once someone finds one and they tell their friends and they have it on Facebook and someone else tells and there's 20 of these guys out there, it gives you like all this time to build up this momentum and and some chatter about it. Um, because if, yeah. it, you know, if it's like, oh, I found this gnome last week and it's like, well, your your window of opportunity has shut down in you know, a couple days or a week. So um, I think there's some value in, in trying out this extended period of time where people start buzzing about it and it builds into maybe even like a competition right for people trying to get the last six gnomes that are out there so yeah Molly's giving us a signal oh you're at the one minute mark so wow time is <laughs> that went fast <laughs> so how, how are you getting the gift certificates um I intend to just go around and purchase them so Wow. Yeah. Maybe still will donate. Yeah, I, I thought about that, but I wasn't sure how that would work out with the city's rules and so forth, because I saw that there's a lot of regulations and stuff around soliciting donations and getting permits for that and so forth. So I thought it, it would just be more straightforward to request the money. Um, and then put my efforts more into the other aspects of, of it. But, but that's, that is definitely something I considered. Yeah. I mean, maybe somebody wants to sponsor a gnome. Yeah, that would be great. <laughs> oh my God, sell ad space. And, <laughs> adopt um, a gnome. <laughs> adopt a gnome. Are you, uh, are you, you're thinking basically 20 different gift certificates, 20 different places. So you really cover a, a large, even well, it would be 29, actually, because uh, there would be yeah, a gift certificate associated with each of the medallions. And then whoever solves the riddle to 
Gig Harbor is great. Long live Gig Harbor would win a gift certificate too. So as you can see, I'm trying to come up with as many winners as possible um, out of this. Yeah. Okay. But it wouldn't necessarily have to be 29 different locations. You could do buy a couple at the tides and whatever. But, but. Sure. But they're yeah. not 29 from the tides. Okay. Oh, yeah, Lord, sorry. no. No. Okay. 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 Molly said time. Thank, Thank you, you very much. If I lose you, then please <laughs> join, join me again. Thank you for your time, folks. Thank I appreciate you. it. Very <laughs> Thank you. That's a wonderful <laughs> idea. Thank you. Yeah. Alrighty. Very good. Uh, wow, that's going to be fun. A lot of work. Woo. <laughs> no kidding. So next is um, how music is made. Bringing music, mu bringing a musical vision to life. Um, are, um, Brendan and Jennifer here. There they are. Hello. <laughs> Welcome, um, hey. Brendan and Jennifer. You're Jennifer. You're Brendan, I guess. <laughs> um, tell us about your project. Yeah. Well, thanks for having us. It's been so cool, just kind of lurking in the shadows and just seeing all the other cool ideas that are that are coming out. So that's been awesome. Yeah, I've enjoyed it. <laughs> so our our idea is um, really has a, there's a couple motivations behind it, and um, one of those is just that you know my wife and I we're we're classically trained musicians with you know the music certificate degrees and stuff like that. But um, there's just so much, there's so much great music and so much, as you guys know, so much great art that's going on in Gig Harbor, but it just, not a lot of people know that there's a lot of great musicians or things that are happening that are really interesting with music in, in Gig Harbor. And, you know, we have a couple of venues like, you know, Zogs was mentioned earlier and Kimball's and Davenport, like you can play a little bit there, but, you know, most of, the, it's almost like, it's almost like, Seattle's outsourced everything to you know us and all the other uh, regions around that, but we all just come into Seattle to play and share our music. So one I, one thing we wanted to do was just let Gig Harborites know just some of the stuff that's going on here and some of the the artists that that are here. And the other thing that we wanted to do was really include people in the creative process, so that people it would be much more interactive than you know the normal here's the piece of art, but people get to see it along the way and ask questions and, you know, the idea of documenting all of this so that eventually, you know, people can see just how a recording is made and how it differs from a live show. And I think that's kind of the, the nuts and bolts. Yeah, and really it, it has um, different parts to it too, the actual, original music that we have finishing up but we have the bulk of it done um and taking that through the process of a recording recording that original music which is its own art form and we thought it would be um really fun and interactive to do a behind the scenes documentary of that process and um so it's going to include some rehearsal time with the musicians and we we work we're going to be working with um, a string quartet, a guitarist, a bassist, an oboist. So just a variety and diversity of um, people and instrumentation for the original music. And then so we'll include the rehearsals for that, and um, also the recording itself in the recording studio. And we've worked at this recording studio before about. Well, eight, eight years it was ago. Eight or nine years so, ago that we were there last time. So, yeah. and, and we, that was our first time then, and we learned a lot. And so, um, and it's, it's such an interesting a atmosphere, actually. Um, it, it's taking the original music, and it's, it's different than taking the original music and performing it live, which is a, its own thing, which we want to do too. That's a culminating uh, event at the end, but the recording itself is its own art form too. So we, we thought, okay, it'd be really great to take that original music, show the behind the scenes of the, re the rehearsals, the recording um, in the studio, and then have the uh, concert at the end and show the documentary 
and play some of the original music live. And we realized that we're hoping that the concert, um, you know, will be accessible at that time. I know that there's still concerns that maybe um, because of COVID that will be um, hard to figure out. But we also have the capability um, to uh, stream that concert as well. So, um, yeah. Well, we would live stream it regardless. Regardless, was, yes, yes, you know. yes. And then along the way, we'd love to interact along the way with um, social media, uh, newsletters through email. There's lots of different ways we could do that, um, but really engage people. Just po you post, uh, you know, what's going on, uh, some photos, little, little videos, and ask questions or just involve people along the way, the creative process, and just uh, kind of inspire others in that way as we go along, kind of being open with it and that's what we're thinking. So, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I, I have a question. Um, it sounds like a really interesting concept. I really love it. I was just curious how long you anticipate the documentary to be. You know, we were gonna, we still have to talk to um, Landon Salyer, the documentary filmmaker that we were gonna use. Um, you know, see what he thinks. You know, the idea is, um, you know, we've watched a lot of, you know, you know, we, we always, we always watch like music videos and behind the scenes, you know, making of, and, uh, you know, so we, we thought, well, I guess the answer is we don't really know how long it would be. Well, we, we'd have to talk to him more. I, I think. We would have to talk to him, but I, I guess initially, I mean, we thought maybe 10, 15 minutes. I'm not sure if we want it to be too long. We could make it longer. Originally, we were thinking of uh, showing it. Um, at the concert, so I I was thinking 15 minutes. It could be longer. It could be shorter. But if you have any suggestions about that, just as I was just I yeah. was just curious because you have $1,500 as the estimate and the budget, and so I know that filmmaking can get quite expensive. And so I was just curious, like, is is he given that flat rate or that would well. He is our colleague as well. So, and I think he would be interested in the pro project. That is a, a low rate for right. a uh, filmmaker, so. But he's willing to do it for for that, you know, but. Okay, that's cool. I just was curious because I know yeah, that. Yeah. No, thank you for bringing that up because yeah, that, that it is a lower right. rate. Yeah, I know all this stuff's so expensive. So we're, we're just trying to like do it yeah. on, yeah, best we can. Bear Creek is over in Woodenville. Yeah, it's in Woodenville. It's a studio that so we're we're both you know we've done lots of studio work and recorded with all sorts of groups around Seattle and all sorts of uh, you know in lots of recording studios and that's the one that has been the favorite one that both of us have have worked in. And just the, the atmosphere of it, it's this really cool like converted barn that they have. Um, and it's just out in the woods and it feels very, very Northwest. And, uh, but I mean, it's got these, you know, huge names that have played there, like, you know, Soundgarden and Lionel Richie and- Brandy Carlisle. Yeah, the Lumineers. I mean, it's, it's all it's, sorts of- It's very beautiful and adds to the process, I feel like. <laughs> Yeah. So. We originally, we, we both wanted to record there, but when we were putting this project together, we started looking around Gig Harbor for like, what's a great recording studio in this area? Cause you know, there's like the mountain house in Tacoma and stuff like that. And um, you know, there's, it's kind of a, it's kind of a recording studio desert out here. We couldn't really find <laughs> much of anything. Much. So. Right, I'm just wondering, um, Woodenville's a long way. I know Bear Creek. I recorded there a couple of times. Oh, long awesome. ago in a lifetime, far, far away. Um, but um, yeah, it's a shame that you would have to go that far. Wouldn't it be nice if there was a good recording studio in Gig Harbor? Yes. <laughs> yes. And if you if you know one, let us know. But <laughs> yeah, there used to be one up on off of Crescent Valley Road, but I haven't heard of them for many, many years. So 
Yeah, we we Google searched and you know, we asked the interwebs and circles of friends and oh, where did you record? And it was <coughs> recording Gig yeah. Harbor. Uh, um, can I ask a couple of questions about your budget? Yeah. Um, it looks like you have um, the creation of a CD. So does the grant all like the grant funds would also support you all not just recording this documentary, but recording um, a CD that you would presumably sell then? Well, the idea is that we are taking these um, pieces of music and we're recording them in a studio. So, I mean, we're affixing it to, you know, a physical medium of having a CD, like a record or something. And then how long do you anticipate the live presentation? Um, like what, what's the length of that concert? Well, we were looking at maybe 60 to 90 minutes with like a, you know, um, that includes like the documentary in there and like a little intermission. Where would you, where would you have the live concert? Yeah, so you, you maybe notice in the budget that there's not a, there's no line item for that. Um, so I, I happen to be, I'm, I'm the, the worship guy at Harbor Covenant Church um, and all, all the music is, is nothing, it's not, um, it's not, it's all secular. There's nothing religious in nature about any of the music, um, but we would be able to use their facilities for free, which includes, you know, AV personnel and sound system that we're well aware of. And we, you know, we have not been doing any um, live services there. So we're getting pretty good at the live streaming thing. So we're confident that all that could happen and at no charge. So it's kind of nice. No kidding. Um, so we have a, um, a very finite budget uh, for which we're very grateful to the city council. Um, if we were not able to fund your entire request, um, <clears throat> and keep in mind that we have 11 other requests that are before us. Um, can you still do the project if we can only fund a part of it? I think it depends on how big of a part of it it would be. Um, you know, the, the recording time you you know i mean it always it always fluctuates how much things are are going to cost and things like that the the general rule of thumb in a professional studio is like one thousand dollars per song is like just a, a generalization and we're looking at 12 recorded pieces of music um so we're, we're trying to keep the costs down it's just unfortunate that everything that we're talking about right now you know happens to be <laughs> all this stuff's expensive um, and we have, uh, you know, it, it's been a year for musicians that's, you know, it's been hard, you know, without gigging and we, we'd, uh, um, so it's, it's just been something that's, we would really value being able to help other musicians by paying for their time and valuing their artistry. So we, anyway, I don't know. I think that the, uh, I think I'm trying to think of a number. I mean, do you, do you need to know a, a number amount or half or fourth or <laughs> that would be anything as helpful to, yeah. Um, to be able, so yeah. One, one minute. Yeah. Okay, one, one okay. minute. Okay, okay. <laughs> How much would we be, you know, like what's the cutoff? And then we could still do it. We would have to raise the rest probably. Um, I feel so, I, I I would say that I would feel confident in completion of the project if half of it was funded. And then we could try to fund the rest, uh, do some fundraising for the rest. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Um, any other questions, real quickly? No. Thanks so much, all. No, thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you. Thank, you. thank you. Wonderful idea. Um. All right. Um, next up is um, ecology. There's Jennifer. And um, Jennifer, you're on. 
Hello. I'm not sure why I'm a static picture instead of a live picture. <laughs> we would love to have a live picture. Is it the video button? There we go. Sure. Hello. Thank Hi. you, everybody. I know this is a late night for all of us, so thank you for being here. Thank you. Tell us about your project. So I came up with a project called Ecology or Echoology. And uh, what it is, is it's combining uh, poetry with art and using the skills of uh, our local poets of Gig Harbor and um, promoting our very special, very unique uh, salmon spawn at Donkey Creek, um, which are the chum salmon that come around uh, every November-ish. And there is a festival in November, you, you're probably aware. And um, so my goal, my passion has always been to bring together art with science and education and community. And that's what I hope to do with this project. I have worked um, on similar projects um, over time. I've been in the community for over 20 years. I have participated in a lot of different collaborations and I am a poet, I'm a writer, and um, I've written kids books, I've written um, collected books of poetry that have to do with Washington State, Wa is Water. And this is a book that combines uh, poetry about our water systems and then nonfiction facts about our state of Washington. And this was through a grant through the city of Tacoma, the TAIP grant. Um, and so I wanted to take my love for water and education. And this is another book I wrote called uh, Snowflakes. I seem to really always be drawn back to water. And um, I want to combine that and reach out to 10 local poets and have their work mounted to aluminum rust free uh, signs. And I saw something similar years ago at the uh, Rhododendron Species Garden. And they had, a, I think, a collection of maybe five or seven poets. And they came and they read their work um, next to their poem that was planted in the ground. And so I started to think, you know, I think this would work out really well along Donkey Creek Park through the Harbor History Museum and then into the Austin Estuary area. Um, that's an area I walk frequently and um, it's one of the first places I ever saw salmon spawning and it was incredibly moving and I think that not a whole lot of our community knows how um, accessible this area is to see our salmon spawning. It's, it's just incredibly unique and um, especially because I think it was the Kiwanis they built that um, the, the area where you can look out and watch. And, and that's been really nice. So the goal would be to do 10 local poets, all using about 11 by 14 um, aluminum signs. And I have something to kind of show you. Um, the original uh, rhododendron piece was on signs like this that are etched which are very rigid and nice and last for a long time. And they're on these special metal stands that just stake into the ground. So when you're done with them, you just pluck them out and you can do what you will with them. It's nice is to give them to the local poets, you know, who wrote the piece. Um, but my pieces would be, um, I would design them all and they would be on something more like this, which is metal and would have rounded corners and just be designed to look very attractive. Um, something similar to other things I've done are uh, where I take poetry and uh, original art and combine them. I'm, I'm sorry, I know this isn't super legible for you. I've, I have no uh, PowerPoint skills. So this is what I'm bringing to the table. <laughs> and then, um, for the project specifically, uh, I would have this logo designed 
And then they would have the title of their piece, the body of their poem. And then there would be a QR code down here that you could use your uh, cell phone camera to follow that code. And what my plan is, is to create a page on my website that offers more information about each uh, poet, more information about Chum Salmon, more information about Donkey Creek. Um, this would be something that could be installed for months and it shouldn't be a problem. It could be, uh, I mean, these signs would last for, for many, many years. And um, they would be in for, I, th I, I envision this culminating at the um, Chum Festival in November where I would ask my poets to do a reading and um, I did talk to uh, Stephanie Lyle at Harbor History Museum, and she has given me permission to use their property to do some installation. So there's nothing that has to be permanently installed, no holes need to be drilled, anything like that. Um, just the, the metal stakes in the ground. Um, five minutes, Molly? No, no, just to comment about placing anything oh. in our public parks and especially along the creek could be problematic. Um, I know they're only temporary, but you're talking about leaving them up for quite a, quite a long period of time. And that would have to go through the parks department. It would have to go through an approval process. And, I, and I'm not sure whether or not that would be allowed. So you might have to find some alternate, like you said, the History Museum, more private property or something along those lines, but maybe you could get approval. But I'm just warning you that there, there could be issues with placing anything in a city right away and along a creek, which is, <clears throat> uh, we're very careful about allowing any kind of signage or placement there, because if we allowed you to do it, then everybody's gonna think, you know, we have to be careful to have a process to follow for something that you're like you're talking about. Lynn, sorry. Yeah, it's, yeah, you know, I, this is such a great idea, Jennifer. I love it. And I knew I was like, the city's gonna have some problem because they have to, they, you know, if they mow and the landscaping and just doing anything is gonna be, but so the Harbor History Museum or, or other Maybe there's a place where they can all be displayed without any problems. And maybe you can get permission during the Chum Festival or leading up mm -hmm. to the Chum Festival for a couple of days or a week, or mm -hmm. maybe just not the six months. Although I love the sure. whole six month idea. Yeah. But if there, if it's because it's culminating the Chum Festival and there'll be more people there, maybe it'll be okay to put them up, even if it's just for that day, but, or that weekend. But, um, gotcha. but yeah. yeah. I think it's awesome. I also love the idea of mm. reusing it, you know, doing whenever at each once a year or whatever. But is that something that you would do? Or are you going to take all these, you know, um, you talked about giving them to the poets, but are you going to be collecting them and then like storing them and having them, you know, for the, for the next year and all that? Yeah, or? That's a good question. Lynn. I hadn't thought about having it as a recurring event. I do like the idea um, my thought was that I would um, give the signs to the poets um, at the end of the festival if the city didn't uh, want them because technically the city would own them and they could do what they wanted. I just unfortunately don't have the space to store them. Okay. But I would totally be open to just doing it, like you said, for either the, the month of November or just for the weekend, the, the festival period, you know. Yeah, that's um, November, right? So you've mm -hmm. got time actually to kind of go jump through some hoops as much as you're willing to. Um, I, I am a hoop jumper. Yeah, you know, with the city, the procedures with the, um, how much you can put, leave them on display or, uh, and where. So it could be a rotating display once, you could be one step ahead of the city. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a like a poet bomb, poetry bombing poetry bombing gorilla poetry yes. park and then you go to another park before they give you a permit i'm just kidding 
I'm not, I'm not just going really la, 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 la. <laughs> Uh, anyway, I'm just trying to maximize, you know, your the investment of your time and the city's uh, funding and all of that. But it's, you've got a little time before the Chum Festival to think about how to maximize that. So it's a great idea. Thank you. Yeah, Jennifer, I love this idea of, of combining kind of all of the different aspects of our community through arts, through poetry. Um, you, you mentioned that you had talked to Stephanie at the Harbor History Museum about like the physical placement of these signs. Um, but I, I love this idea of the poetry kind of performances. Have you mm -hmm. um, have you reached out at all to Harbor Wild Watch because they do salmon counts and salmon programming like every weekend during November, October, November, December, counting the salmon that are down there. So that Ooh. might also be another like live venue moment when there oh, are- Oh, I would love that. That would be fantastic, uh, yeah. They also have a gallery space um, where they they often put artwork or or things at the Scancy House, um, because I like I think all of our ears went up like oh my gosh signs on public property like <laughs> that, that's not gonna that's not gonna fly, um, but there might be some other ways to rethink um, a a longer term display of that um, that great work. Mm. Thank it's you for the ideas. I, I think also that maybe, um, and I don't know, maybe I'm speaking out of turn, but you know, the city, if, if after those signs are done being displayed in whatever fashion you come up with, um, if they go into the city uh, art collection, mm -hmm. and then they could be rotated out occasionally depending, you know, on display at city hall or other places mm -hmm. in the future. And I, would the city have any, like, I mean, I understand from a signage point of view, the permitting, but I wonder too, with Donkey Creek, because it's a salmon stream and like put, putting things in the ground might cause issues um, on that side of the trail on the stream side. But I wonder if they were oh. to the um, railings, they yeah. couldn't be taken and um, maybe that might address some of the environmental concerns if there's any yeah they would definitely be on the on our walking trail side okay yeah so the others yeah are. it's a beautiful idea and definitely work with stephanie and Lindsay at harbor wild watch thank you uh, coordinating yeah. would be fantastic i think we have about one more minute so is there um two, oh, two minutes molly says two minutes okay well, we got plenty of time uh, other discussion, other questions. I, I love just, this idea, Jennifer. Who are some well, of the people you. you're going to be um, look, reaching out to? Uh, well, they shouldn't, in case we don't get this, but um, Michael McGee was one, um, Christy Gledhill, and um, Larry Owens is one of the poets. Um, Do you know Jesse Turner? I'd love I'm to sorry? see you. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Charlie. I'm sorry. Do you know Josie Turner? Yes. yes. Talk to Josie. Yeah. I'd also would love, would love to see you reach out to the Poet Laureate who is from the Kitsap Peninsula, the new Poet Laureate of the state. And if she is from the Kitsap Peninsula. I didn't know that. Yeah. Oh, very cool. <clears throat> Um, Jennifer, given given all of our concerns around the signs, um, the the sign material is is about what a third of your budget, maybe a little less than that. Um, yeah. Would you be willing, if that doesn't work, to you know reallocate what a kind of public presentation of these poems might look like? Um, I we I could... am, and I there are options, and I was looking into them, and. Um, there would be differences in fact, like you would have like no color, you know? So we would have something that looks more like this that is not etched, it's printed. It's just printed on acrylic. And I like the idea of metal um, because it's just kinder to the environment, but I can drop the price if I look in different uh, substrates. Or even if like permanent, like signage isn't an option for this, like, would you be willing to rethink what some sort of presentation of these poems looks like? 
because a lot of your budget is around, you know, writer stipends and, and graphic design. So there might be some other ways to think about it. Or is that a like, or is that like a, what's the word I'm looking for? A, it, it wouldn't kill the project. It would just, it would just look different. It would be much easier to design this <laughs> than to, you know, come up with 10 designs like this. So it would save a lot of time. It just would look very different. But well, I could do I it. I have, have a feeling that you might, if you come up with a uniform design of everything, that mm -hmm. might be a hurdle that will help yes. you over a little easier. Because like more like this with just the the emblem. Yeah. Or, or something. Just I'm because, so sorry to have to cut you yeah. off, but it, it is time for our next presenter. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you for your time. Thank you, Jennifer. Nice That's idea. Wonderful idea. Thank you. Wow, we got so much inspiration, don't we? Oh, <laughs> amazing projects. Very, some very clever, very clever. No kidding. All right, we have um, Barbara and Amanda. Yes, indeed. Are you here, ladies? There you hey. are. Good evening. Um, hi, guys. Hello, hello. It's a pleasure to all be together. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> So tell us about, um, are they, are there two projects? There's, a, there's one tell project. Us, tell us about your projects. All right, wonderful. Yeah. We absolutely will. And a wonderful way to um, combine all our projects and talk about them under um, one description would be that we believe that we all desire unity within our community. And some of us through music, experiencing music together as participants in the audience and also on stage as musicians. And uh, we believe in community collaborating together and supporting everyone so that together um, we can be all uplifted uh, as a united community. And so, yes, we do have. Um, and I think, yeah, I think we know, uh, we know most everybody and they know us, but my name is Barbara Hammerman. I'm Amanda Gresham. That's Amanda Gresham. <laughs> And together we work on several projects that we want to bring to the greater audience in Gig Harbor. And yes, Charlie, it's um, it is one project with two separate weekends spanning several months, so that we can combine all all of the elements in bringing people together for concerts and two specific national events. One is the Make Music Day, which happens every year on the summer solstice, June twenty first, and um, there are about a thousand venues around the world. I don't know how much you had a chance to look at it, but we've been wanting to bring this to Gig Harbor for a while. This will be our seventh, eighth year, yeah. eighth year to participate in different cities. Um, in Washington state, there uh, is a Make Music Day in uh, Seattle, in Issaquah and Federal Way. And we feel like Gig Harbor deserves its own Make Music Day. <laughs> and uh, this is a place uh, where everybody can come together. And I, I just can't, I just have to, we, <laughs> we have been so fulfilled by listening to everybody that has had something to say today. And we keep looking at each other and say, they could be a make music day. We could do that. They could be, they could be a part of it. They're in our community. <laughs> we can include that in the poetry, so art, I mean, video projects, making, everything. And, oh my gosh, the poetry. That was so interesting. Yes, it's we loved all, that. They are all candidates because make music day is about the art and the music. So in addition to Make Music Day, which happens on June 21st, so I got very excited there, we, <laughs> we, we, we move forward into the latter part of the year and we wanted to span the two seasons. And we recognize that having something within the high tourist season is uh, desirable, but having something in a little bit off season also brings other people to the community. And so the second thing that we'd be having is what we call, and it, the whole thing is called Fest for All, because we involve all the community arts in both of these weekends in various ways. And on the second weekend, we have a concert that is specifically in, in, engaged in bringing new audiences to Gig Harbor and specifically focusing on those who are not included as much as other groups, uh, specifically our United by Music North America group and outreaching to others who are similarly situated and we are a performance-based organization, nonprofit, 
And we seek to find people who are musically talented who have developmental challenges such as autism. We know that there's so many more people out there that can benefit from the program and we just want to find them and provide a place for them to soar. And that's not just in Gig Harbor, but could be bringing people to Gig Harbor. So to that answer, it's two weekends. Um, and Amanda has, I think something that we've been doing during COVID that expands the reach for everybody. So uh, Amanda is the producing artistic director for a couple of projects. And of course, when they're all music projects, so everybody kind of stopped all of our <laughs> music friends and colleagues as we know, it's just been kind of a, a dry period, but uh, Kept going. <laughs> especially for the United by Music group, our artists and mentors, yeah. uh, they're already isolated. They're yeah. very isolated, not included in a lot of activities. Um, it's really They're important. kind of, you know, I, I just want to make it one point and I want you yeah. to talk about how we expanded it, but sure. something I've learned, I've learned so much during this period, haven't we all? But one of the things that I came to the realization is that there's there are a lot of marginalized groups and we want to work really hard, all of us, I can tell in this group, to bring everybody together in diversity, uh, equity, inclusion. But I came to realize that everybody, whether... These marginalized groups might be thought of as... Uh -oh. And, um, certainly the black communities we have in our group, all of those uh, people and those represented. So we have kind of at least a double uh, whammy, if you will. And um, Amanda has done something that's pretty exciting as we go forward. And I know we want to do questions, but talk about the uh, virtual nature of activities that we Absolutely. want to bring to all of these things, all four days. Yeah, that's yeah. a really good point. That's yeah. really true because we do include um, all those communities in our programs. And, uh, so virtual. So yes. So um, when it appeared that um, our music was coming to a halt publicly, oh, no. we weren't able to participate as we are used to doing. Um, the show must go on as the mm -hmm. saying happens. And so immediately um, we were so fortunate that um, I've kept our group connected virtually even before COVID. We, we did FaceTime uh, for those mm -hmm. with iPhones. There were other ways that we um, kept connected and then we expanded to Zoom. And so we've kept rehearsals going with something I've coined as zoom hearsals. And so our community who is, as Barbara said, is already feeling isolated. They needed to feel connected, valued, appreciated, and relevant. It was imperative that they kept feeling relevant. And I think everybody wants to feel that they, uh, if you choose the word matter in this world, or if you choose the word relevant in this world, that you have a purpose that somebody values you. And so it's really important, especially in this community, if they may not be able to differentiate between the two or be able to um, uh, uniquely think that they value. And so we've kept it going with uh, Zoom rehearsals so and singer songwriter storyteller sessions. And so I brought in um, my friends. I happen to have been, this is probably the third decade in the music industry now. Uh, so I have, you know, national, international um, award-winning musicians that are just exceptional friends. And so what we've been able to do is incorporate them as mentors in all of our programs and as musicians in various um, companies that I've had. So we've been able to connect them in ways we usually waited till their tours came through. Mm -hmm. But now I just call them and say, uh, let's have a 30, 45 minutes together. Um, you're about to win you know, a blues music award or I see that you're Grammy nominated. Would you like to talk to our artist about this? So we have half a dozen artists. They get together virtually and then they have a conversation. They do a workshop. They learn music, they're playing music. They're experiencing their same connectivity and togetherness, except we've learned and we've taught, this is their new stage yeah. right here, this rectangle. They learned a this lot is, of skills this period. Yeah, this <laughs> is their new stage. And so um, that just a little preview. you to what we are going to be doing for Make Music Day. So as um, founders and creators, uh, some of you are familiar with Song Farmers. We've been able to found that chapter here and present it, yeah. Making Music Together. We're going to incorporate that in Make Music Day. And bring Song Farmers out to the green. <laughs> right. So in not just in house concerts, but now it's going to be outside. And because of the virtual aspect, which will be included in everything that we do, we could if they're interested, every resident of Gig Harbor and the connected communities can be a part of this. Now they don't have to physically be there. They'll be able to connect virtually because they've been doing this for over a year now. And they'll be able to participate to the extent that they're comfortable. And for those, um, there are gonna be acoustic sets because one thing I always think of 
being with United by Music is those that are development, the developmentally delayed and have different abilities. Um, they also have I call superhero skills and superhero mm -hmm. traits. Yeah. So some are really hearing is a very important part. So some have exceptional hearing where sounds, it needs to be of a certain decibel level, right? It can't be too high. So I love acoustic music anyway. So we're absolutely gonna have acoustic quarters. We'll have um, more uh, band representation that there'll be storybook readings. There'll be um, how to play your own instruments. There's so many ideas that we've already done previously. We've done Make Music Day for almost a decade now. So we're just gonna bring it to the virtual world and here in Gig Harbor. Mm -hmm. uh, we'd love for Gig Harbor to be the community, but we will present bring others it. as well. I mean, yeah. And bringing musicians. I mean, I, everybody wants to perform together. We wanna right. get out. And I think in June, by June 21st, summer solstice, uh, to the extent the Washington guidelines will permit, right. um, we will gather people and then have some that are, are uh, virtual as well. Yeah. And these can be recurring. We, we intend for them to be recurring events that benefit Gig Harbor and Absolutely. the residents. Absolutely. So, yeah. Um, so do you, do you have a venue set for either of these? We, we have some, some dream venues uh, <laughs> and we, it will depend on the, the scope that we're able to produce based in part, of course, on the grant. Um, but we'd love to keep it in the heart of Gig Harbor, but we could have several venues. For instance, if we were to do it on the waterfront somewhere, if we did Scancy, if that was available, and we could have a couple of the other parks represented with other groups along, people could walk along and see different ones. So um, that really depends on what's available. And uh, we've, we've, we've allowed for rental if we need to. And I know that there are a couple of places downtown that do rent, um, but that's, yeah, I think that's flexible and it's uh, completely dependent on the scope of what's able to be done. Yeah, yeah. Other questions? Molly, what do we have, four minutes? Three. Three minutes. It goes so fast. <laughs> Uh, other questions? So if, um, because well, I have to say, I just want to say how I admire their vision. Yeah, I like, I like thinking big. I like when people think big. <laughs> Only way to go. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, yeah. And Within think, that vision, anything can be achieved, well, right? Well, and it's scalable. I mean, That's obviously, exactly. um, yeah, the community you know, support. One, one, of the, one of the questions obviously relates to if it's not able to be funded entirely, you know, yeah. would you still do it? And uh, we do intend to. Uh, what we'll be able to do depends on yeah. our being able to, you know, and honestly create collaborations in the community. The whole thing is designed yeah. to bring the community together, not just on that day, but yep. together to work toward this. And I mean, every, almost every single, you know, bring the band group down there, bring the two young fellas who have the band that they want to produce, <laughs> let them do it on Make Music Day. I mean, yeah. there's so many ways to- That big, to beautiful orchestra. Have you know, collective be, work. Yeah. So, you know, you look at the, the budget item that has to do with gear. I right. mean, that one, that one budget item, it could be anything from, you know, 2,000 to 6,000 to zero if we're able to get sponsors yeah. or maybe not zero, but <laughs> something like that. Yeah, I think a really so important part is depending on the community collaboration and participation yeah. that really dictates- And getting the excitement going. You yeah. know, how high we can soar. Absolutely. Thank, thank you, Robin, for validating our dreams <laughs> that we want everybody to yeah. be involved in. Yes, absolutely. So is yeah. your um, budget here, is that based on kind of your ideal? It's kind of in a perfect world. Like it sounds like you don't know how many musicians and you don't know how much space we rented. Is this kind of um, these numbers you came up with are just sort of the an ideal kind of it's, realm? I can speak. Good. It's yeah. pre previous experience based. Yeah. Truly, it, it has to do with community inclusion, collaboration, support. Uh, it ranges and we, uh, it's scalable and attainable. And so the budget absolutely depends. We can achieve any part of it based on the budget that we receive. You know, I, I'll point you to one thing. I know we don't have a lot of time, but if you look at the, <clears throat> if you get a chance to look at the packet uh, the, that you put together. Yes, the Google has link a, has a, a so number many. of videos yeah. and some of our posters, et cetera. Take a look at the one we did for Washington State Fair. There is a poster there that talks about Fest for All, and that was one of our 
our most exciting and fun things. And that was all yeah. day. So to speak to your question, Lynn, uh, if we did one stage and we did what we did there, mm -hmm. that was 10 to five. And with the s several bands coming through with attendant events around yeah. the edges, an art exhibit, for instance, mm -hmm. uh, some by some of our artists. Absolutely. And so I would think that would be the core of it. And yeah. that would be somewhere at the at the medium point on this budget. Yeah. And then the more we're able to do, then we would expand. Absolutely. Yeah. And you'll see in that Google link, it will definitely provide probably answers to most of your questions. There's photos, there's videos, there's promotion, what Make Music Day looks like. So many answers to your questions can be achieved through that Google link. <laughs> yeah. You have our phone numbers too. <laughs> but first of all, thank you guys for inviting us to do this and exposing us to all yeah. these other people. Next time we, we can separate all of our segments so we could have 15, 15, 15. Yeah, we have more time to talk. Thank you very much. Thank you so, so much. much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you guys. Bye. <laughs> All right. Decisions, decisions, decisions. Ooh, wait. Oh my gosh. Oh, scratch here though. My gosh. Um, Monica, what? are you here instead of Guy? Who? Monica. I think Monica is now Guy. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay. Ooh. Monica, your voice is so low. <laughs> Gosh, guy, we won't ask any questions, but um, my oh my. Yeah, well, it's the. We can't see you. It's the millennium. We need we, <laughs> we need to see you. Do I need to um, rename I don't you? No, why you don't see me? Oh, here we go. Video. Oh, there's there Monica. There he is. Hi. Hello, Arts Hi, Commissioner. Guy. Hi, guy. Did you make me go at eight o'clock on purpose, Molly? <laughs> yeah, I thought so. It's called payback. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So, so tell us tell us about the video, Guy. Well, the video is, is uh, spawned by last year's Arts Commission proposal, which once we began to implement it later than we should have, it became pretty clear to me that it was more about interviews and history than it was about a tour through the boat shop. So uh, once that got clarified, uh, Josh from the Waterfront Association, he's our videographer, we began a series of interviews to, to uh, document those who are left from various periods of Ed and Boatyard site occupancy from the Anderson boatyard in the 20s, 1920s, through the Glen period. So we, we interviewed one of the surviving members, well, surviving. I mean, he's the great grandson of Conrad Anderson. And we got, a, we got that section kind of in the can and it helped propel the, the thinking on the rest of it. And the, the next owners of the boatyard the, uh, were the, was the Glen family. So we we have that an interview from Gary Glenn and the, you know, uh, established, and he's the nephew of Art Glenn, who built the existing Ed and Boatyard, which I'm sure you all know is owned by the city and operated by the Gig Harbor Boat Shop. So, um, so it's sometime in December when the holidays were coming, it became clear we weren't going to be able to pull it off. So, uh, we're we're asking all of you again. It's, uh, I think, a worthy project. It, it, it'll uh, inform the community and those beyond the community of an uh, important historic site and those families and people that were there and operated at the site, built boats, repaired boats. And uh, I've learned a bit already. So, uh, not too arty, but fairly cultural. I think a valuable addition to our community's history. Questions? Um, where, where will the video be shown? The video will be made available in manners that uh, 
internet type matters that I'm not as clued into as say Monica, if she was here, she would tell you. So, uh, you know, uh, there'll be links to the video on the website and our Facebook page and all those type of things. We'll probably, uh, yeah, probably generate a press release for the local paper and uh, <coughs> we'll okay. advertise where you can see it. Maybe we'll have a premiere at the Edinburgh Yard. <laughs> Is it, uh, Guy, is it going to include things like the Thunderbird boat? That... Yeah, it'll include, uh, you know, it'll, I mean, the, the basic history of the boat yard is Conrad Anderson founded it in 1920. And uh, he was a Norwegian immigrant that had worked at the Scanzi's yard. And, uh, and then uh, he ended up retiring. And uh, Art Glenn bought the facility in the mid 40s and built the existing boat yard in 1945. And he had a, a short but intense impact. Uh, I mean, he actually built the brick house and the existing boat yard. And, uh, and then he uh, recruited my family and my dad's partner, Don, uh, to buy the boat yard. He got frustrated in the mid or in 1950. He was, uh, the harbor was iced, iced up and he couldn't haul or launch boats for months. And uh, that, that did him in. So he moved to California. Uh, months? So all, all, the video will expand on all that. I mean, that's, wow. that's the core. And then, you know, we, if there's time, uh, we may, might do the, the city gig harbor boat shop portion of it, or maybe that becomes something something separate later okay so your this video is about the history of the property exactly not so much about the craft of the boat building and like the thunderbird boat and things like that well yeah yeah you can't talk about the property without talking about things like the development of the thunderbird you know uh the fish boats conrad anderson built okay and uh, art glenn built yeah you Will, I mean, we've interviewed four people so far and uh, almost every interview talks about some of the boats that were built and the people that built them, so. Is it mostly a collection of interviews then or do you have a script? Um, well, I, I've kind of written a script. I, uh, it turns out that we uh, needed to have it moderated. So I, I am the moderator mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, it's, it's organized and uh, we've collected some photos and identified some people that were previously unidentified or misidentified in uh, like the History Museum's photos. Um, thanks to Bill, uh, Bill Gardner, the great grandson of Conrad Anderson. So, so uh, there'll be some, some new information in there that, that uh, hasn't come to light before. Cool. a bit of that and uh great how how long do you anticipate the final product being i'm thinking it might be we're it's hard to know the first section is probably five five minutes so it could easily be 15 minutes to maybe 20. Oh, okay depending on if we expand beyond private ownership to city ownership of the boatyard Sure. And then just a question about your budget, um, which is kind of a question for you. And then also Molly, check me. Um, does your budget hours, which are the, the video production hours, does it just include new recording uh, that would happen if awarded this grant? Or does it also include recording that happened during 2020? Yeah, it would probably include, uh, well, I think the bottom line is, is uh, the boat the boat shop will supplement anything that doesn't get covered. So uh, we haven't received any invoices from Josh yet for what, what's been done because we pulled the plug because we knew we wouldn't get it done. So to answer your question, uh, yeah, it would include previous work if that was okay. If it wasn't, uh, the boat shop will pay for it. So. Um, there'll probably be more hours. Yeah, Molly, can we include previous work? 
I think because he hadn't, they hadn't provided any invoices. Uh, the final product, I think, is what we're going to be working on. So I don't, I don't see any issue with that. I just He's wanted to clarify one it. final invoice from this guy, and it'll be dated 2021. Okay, perfect. I just wanted to clarify so nobody was disappointed at the end. <laughs> well, we're committed to finishing it because we started it. So if it takes longer than the budget allows, and we'll we'll supplement it. So. Hmm. Well, we've known about it for a while. I think everybody will be eager to see it when it's done. Oh, good. Yeah. Hey, when you get back to being able to have your concerts at the um, boat, um, the boat shop, that could be the kind of thing that'd be cool to be playing, you know, before the concert starts. Well, yeah, it could be the premiere. Yeah. Of, yeah. <laughs> a concert. Yeah. Sure. Any, any further queries, questions? comments i think it's a great idea yeah i like it cool yeah i think i think it's um it, it's about time the the boat shop <laughs> documented its its own history so i think it's great yeah i mean there's not uh everybody's getting older so it's <laughs> getting hard to getting hard to find bill gardner was a real fine because he's a a, a family history buff of the anderson family so and he actually owns the equator, one of the bigger saners that was built at the Anderson Yard and was in the harbor most of my life. And now it sits up in the lake at, at his Gardner boat repair on Lake Union. So uh, yeah, we got a tour through the boat and pretty, uh, pretty neat stuff. Wow. And when was, um, was the, what's the new one that you just got? The, 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 Victory, the saner that. Oh, the veteran. Veteran, yeah. Yeah. Was that where was that built? Scansy. Scansy, okay. Yeah, it's probably uh, there's a couple Scansy saners still floating. Uh, Veterans one, the Emancipator in Seattle is another. There's one in Canada, and of course Shenandoah at the Harbor History Museum. It it will right. never be refloated, but yeah. Yeah. Plus, there, plus there, an untold of number of Thunderbirds. So, what's that? Plus an untold number of Thunderbirds. Yeah, there's lots of lots of Thunderbirds. Yeah. So. so yeah. Any Before, any other questions? No. Okay. Great. I guess I guess you're done, guy. Thank you. Well, great. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks so much. Thank you for. Thanks, guy. Uh, see you, Molly. <laughs> <laughs> sorry you were late we we took them in order of how the applications came in guys sorry oh well i'm always late so i get what i deserve the, the late guy hopping see, oh. see you guys oh. bye oh wonderful um we'll thank you all, all. Yeah, I just have to say that I, I just want to say that I think when we envisioned this this endeavor creative endeavor grant a few years ago, this is where we hoped it would be. Like this year is it's really special. There's a lot of good ideas floating there. It's great. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's so good. That's so good to hear that it has that y'all have seen it evolve. This is my first experience with it. Um, so it's great. Um, Molly, is this all the applicants? Yes. Okay, so we're we don't have to do on Saturday. No. Way, yes. yay! <laughs> so what is our? Can we clarify our homework before our meeting next week, just so everybody shows up ready to make decisions on Wednesday? <laughs> Charlie, well, um, I assume I've taken a lot of notes. I assume um, everybody. everybody just want you to be aware that yeah. we still have guests and we are still in a public meeting. Yeah. We still have one attendee, so careful what you say. Right. Just yeah. discussing process, which will be we'll on be the record. Process will be on the record. Yeah. No um, deliberation tonight. No. Yeah, no deliberation, but I'm, um, I took lots of notes. I'm probably assuming that most of you did also. Um, Molly provided the uh, kind of score sheet that we came up with last year. And unless anyone sees 
um, critical needs to change that, I think that we'll just um, use that as a basis of our discussion next Wednesday and um, be prepared to, if, if you can maybe write in pencil your um, uh, evaluation of each one and um, keeping in mind that um, our pot is $25,000 and we have, I don't know how many thousands of dollars. I think it's 37,000, 37,063. 37, okay. Oh my God. So we are going to have to sharpen our pencils and um, as, as always, as always, and figure out how to divvy that up equitably and in ways that we think will be most beneficial to the um, the uh, vision of the grants. Yeah. Can we okay, get great. a copy of the questionnaire that we're going to be using ahead of time? I, think I sent it out this afternoon. You did? Oh, okay. Yeah, it's it, on the link, and I think it's um, it's really helpful as as Charlie said to kind of pencil in to uh, to go to do some pre evaluation. Mm -hmm. before we get to the meeting and decide, you know, where you think these things fall. Um, no, absolutely. We want you to have those filled out before you come to the meeting. Yeah. Okay. So that's our homework. Fill out that rubric, score everybody's grant, and then make our own personal recommendation for what we want to recommend. Right. What you think, you know, would be, you know, if you want to partially fund, fully fund, Okay, not, I just wanted to make sure, that are yeah. not fund at all. I mean, they're all options, right? Okay, I just wanted to make sure we all came with the same homework done. Yes. <laughs> I'm and all about accountability right now. <laughs> and once you fill out the rubric, uh, that will help you make the decision on funding, not funding, and at what level to fund, because it will become more apparent as the numbers add up and go, you know, off to the right hand column. Right. And which ones get the most points? Um, you know, that's that's how well, we do it. Right, and then we, you know, of course we go back and forth, but I do find that we pretty much seem to all fall in line. Uh, I mean, we all kind of come to similar conclusions using right. the trick. yeah. Right, last year, the last couple of years, we've had the advantage of being able to be together and we had a big erase board behind us that we, you know, erased, okay, we're going to have to, we are, we're going to have to diminish this one somehow in order to not be over our $25,000. So I'm not sure how we will. Well, we can do that. that. We can just share, have Molly, we'll create a um, Excel spreadsheet and Molly can share it. And then you guys can, once you fill in the numbers, we'll put the numbers to the left and then start. Yeah. Yeah, we can do that. Little thing. Thank you, Molly. Yeah. Okay, great. The wonders of Excel. Yeah. Good. Well, thanks everybody. This was uh this was awesome to be a part of. Yeah. yeah. Good night. And I'm glad we have yeah. Saturday <laughs> back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> good job, Thanks Molly. For working us all in. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Molly. Good. All right. See everybody next week. Thank you. You guys so win.